Excellent, folks. I see the live stream. We're looking good. Um, cloud recording underway. Backup is rolling. Good morning, and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing of the Excellent Committee on um, Governmental good. Operations. Uh, and pardon me as I close off that stream so we don't hear that. Thank you very much. And as I was saying, welcome to the today's remote New York City Council hearing of the Committee on Governmental Operations. At this time, would all panelists please turn on their video. To minimize disruption, please silence your electronic devices. And if you wish to submit testimony, you may do so via email at the following address, testimony at council.nyc.gov. Once again, that's testimony at council.nyc.gov. Thank you for your cooperation. We are ready to begin. Thank you so much, uh, Sergeant of Arm. Gavilay, today's meeting. Good morning. I am Council Member Fernando Cabrera, Chair of the Committee on Governmental Operations. I want us to start off by thanking the members of the committee who have joined us today. We have with us uh, Council Members. Uh, Dharma Diaz, Council Member Drum, Council Member Kalos, Council Member myself, Council Member Miller, Council Member Yeager, and Council Member Powers. Uh, today, the committee will be conducting an oversight on independent expenditures in the New York City elections. In light of the Supreme Court decisions like Citizens United, powerful interests can spend unlimited sums of money on political ads, as long as they do not coordinate their expenditure with candidates. These so-called independent expenditures have come to play a large role in American politics in New York City. Independent expenditure groups known as super PACs spend over $36 million, spent over $36 million on 2021 primary election. The New York City Charter imposes certain disclosures and reporting requirements on super PACs and other outside spenders. These requirements are enforced by the New York City Campaign Finance Board. Through the board's follow the money portal, the New, New Yorkers can find information about the individuals and organizations that fund political advertisements. This transparency is critical to ensuring that voters can evaluate the political information they encounter and can walk into the voting booth well informed. Today's hearing, we hope to learn more about the role of independent expenditures, expenditures play in our local elections, and about the campaign finance board's work in enforcing the city's independent, independent expenditure laws. In addition, the committee will be hearing seven pieces of legislation. Introduction number 1901, sponsored by Council Member Brad Lander, will impose certain disclosure requirements on those attempting to influence local ballot initiative. Introduction number 2453, also sponsored by Council Member Lander, will provide spending limit relief to certain candidates facing high amounts of outside spending. Introduction number 2429, sponsored by Council Member Calvin Yeager, will give the mayor greater discretion over the CFE proposed appropriations in the executive budget. Introduction number 2438, sponsored by Council Member Helen Rosenthal, will require the use of videos in the CFB online voter guide and will re ensure that such videos are available in more language, include, including American Sign Language. Introduction 1937, sponsored by Council Member Daniel, uh, Danny Drum, will expand upon the charter's requirement for city agencies to collect certain demographic information. Introduction 2459, sponsored by Council Member Oswald Felice, will require the mayor to establish an office of information privacy. And finally, introduction number 2409, sponsored by Council Member Denise Miller, will allocate responsibility for cleaning and maintaining certain outdoors areas of city property. And with that, I wanna thank uh, Council Members Lander, Yeager, Rosenthal, Drum, Felice, and Miller for the leadership on this bill. Also, I want to take a moment 
uh, taking some uh, chairman uh, uh, privilege here. Uh, this is gonna be my last oversight uh, hearing on governmental operations. I have to tell you in the 12 years that I have served the council, as uh, many of you know, this December, uh, I'll be out of the council. Uh, and in the last four years, I have to say, serving in this committee uh, has been truly a joy. I want to thank every single one of the committee members, uh, Council Member uh, Dharma Dia, Council Member uh, Levin, Kalos, myself, Perkin, Powers, uh, Rodriguez, and Yeager. Uh, you've been amazing. Uh, you, you are truly, you truly do care about what happens in the city. Uh, uh, some of you, you're going to move to the next chapter in your life, and I truly wish you uh, the the best because uh, you truly deserve it. And those who uh, will continue, uh, we 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 also wish you the best as you are. We're going to be confronting some big challenges in the coming years uh, with the budget gaps that we're going to have and, uh, and still dealing with COVID. So I also want to thank uh, the, the, I call it the dream team. Uh, this staff has been amazing. CJ Murray, Sebastian Bacci, who are uh, still with us. Uh, you are troopers. You, you, you're so attentive to detail and precision. And uh, two staff that just recently left us, Elizabeth Cronk and Emily Ford John. Uh, what, a, what a true joy working with them. Uh, and my own staff, Legislative Director Clark Pena. Thank you for, for always being there. And uh, in the Sergeant of Arms, uh, I salute every single one of you for the great work. Uh, you're amazing. And so with that, uh, I want to uh, now welcome uh council uh like to welcome councilman lander to give statement on his bills chair i don't think we have council member lander yet so we can um move on to the next bill sponsor okay thank you so much with that we go to council Mary yeager to give an opening statement on his bill good morning mr chairman thank you very much and thank you to uh the city agencies who are here today um, I'm going to speak on several bills. First, uh, on the one that I introduced, um, uh, introduction uh, 2429, which is supported by uh, more than half the council. Uh, this is a very simple bill uh, in design uh, because what it does is very simple. It brings the campaign finance board to uh, the position that every other city agency is. They currently uh, submit their budget uh, request uh, which is not so much a request as much as it is a demand to the mayor in March, uh, thus excluding itself from the preliminary budget process. I see uh, uh, finance chair Drum is here and anybody who's paid attention to this council over the next over the last four years has uh, witnessed the hundreds of hours, not an exaggeration, that chair Drum has led the preliminary and executive budget hearings, uh, never missing a single one, never missing a single moment. And the work of this council, uh, particularly over the last four years on the budget has been uh, rigorous, um, uh, fierce and deliberate. Um, but with the exception of one agency, which excludes itself from the preliminary budget process because um, by design of the charter, their budget requests are submitted in March instead of February, like every other agency. So what our bill does is requires the campaign finance board to submit its uh, budget to the mayor in February, and thus allowing Chair Drum's successor as finance chair to try to step into his giant shoes next term and bring them in so that like every other agency, they can tell the council what it is they need and why. It's called transparency. It's what the CFB claims that it stands for. And it's what we're here on several other bills that I'll also mention, um, which I am co-sponsoring, uh, uh, Councilman Landers 1901, uh, with respect to the greater disclosure of the identity of contributors for independent expenditures, uh, and particularly introduction 2453, uh, sponsored by Councilman Lander and myself. And <clears throat> he's not here, and I, you know, those who know me know I will never pretend to speak for Councilman Lander at all in this council, but I'll speak for myself. Uh, I am supporting Councilman Lander's bills on this uh, topic. 
um, because we've seen the result and the impact of it, independent expenditures on elections in this city. To be sure, they are constitutionally protected. It is free speech, it is allowed, it is permissible, it is lawful. But that doesn't mean that government can't react to constitutionally protected speech. Government does it in many ways. It does it, for example, with, land, with slander and, and libel suits. Um, in many ways, government reacts to free speech. And this is a way for government to react to free speech. Right now, a candidate runs for something, agrees to participate in campaign finance program, agrees to a cap on how much they're going to be able to spend on their campaign. And then uh, along comes an independent spender who floods the race with mail and with, uh, um, uh, you know, sometimes negative against one particular candidate, sometimes positive against another candidate. But at the end of the day, doesn't really do much for the public discourse because it is not the candidates speaking to the voters, it's outside interests speaking to the voters. What this bill does is it simply releases the candidate from the agreement that he or she made to abide by a particular spending cap. It doesn't give the candidate any more public funds. What it does is it says, candidate, you now have the ability to respond to what's being said about you. That makes sense. So what I would do uh, is particularly with introduction 2453, which I know will have to be amended uh, for various technical reasons before it actually is passed by this council, I would actually set the trigger lower. It shouldn't be that when a candidate spends three times the spending limit, it should be as, I'm sorry, when an IE spends three times the spending limit, it should be as soon as an independent expenditure committee hits a threshold uh, uh, small enough, but large enough to know that that IE is actually spending in this race in a significant way. Perhaps that number should be 50% of the spending limit, but it shouldn't be three times the spending limit because that would mean, for example, in a council race, that until the independent spender hits about 600,000, the candidate would not have the relief that this bill is designed to give. I would reduce that trigger to a point where the candidate is now armed with the ability to go out and respond to what's being said about them um, or to what's being said in favor of an opponent of theirs by an IE. This is, again, good government at its core, allowing people to respond, to talk to the voters and to get their positions out without the undue influence of outside spenders. Uh, uh, Councilman Landers introduction 1901 is, again, very basic transparency. It tells people who these, who, who's spending in these races. It gives New Yorkers a chance to know what are the entities, what are the interests that are out there that are spending. And I think that these are smart bills. I know that there are other bills, but I'll leave that to uh, the chair and the other members uh, to speak about them. So I'll turn this back over to you, Mr. Chair, and I'm very grateful for your time this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And with that, I'd like to recognize we've been joined by Council Member Rodriguez and as it was mentioned, our chair of finance and uh, Danny Drum. And, and Danny, thank you for your friendship. Thank you for all the hearings that we uh, did together uh, during March and, and May. Uh, you, you're a true, a true leader. So with that, uh, 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 I'll turn it over to you to give an opening statement on your bill. Thank you very much, uh, Chair Cabrera. Thank you for your kind words. It's been a pleasure to work with you as well. Uh, over the last 12 years, we came in the same class and uh, I think we've done a lot of good together for the city of New York. So thank you, Chair Cabrera. Thank you also thank you. to uh, Council Member Yeager for your kind words. I appreciate it very much. Being chair of the Finance Committee has been the um, opportunity of a lifetime. It's been such a pleasure for me to be able to do that. And uh, I really do agree with you on your legislation that it is important that we have additional oversight and transparency and, sh and sunshine on the operations of the Campaign Finance Board. So I'm proud to be co-sponsoring that legislation along with you. Now, my legislation today is about data uh, collection and the arguments for collecting, analyzing and using demographic data are myriad. The commercial sector has long recognized the importance of data and new technologies have only opened up greater possibilities. It is time for New York City to realize the same. In 2016, the council passed a package of legislation sponsored by council member Chin and me, which was subsequently enacted to improve how the city deals with demographic data, specifically by requiring the collection of information on a host of ancestries and languages 
multiracial identity, and sexual orientation and gender identity. Five years later, we now have a very clear picture. Unfortunately, not of the communities we intended to learn about, but of the administration's struggles to implement local laws 126, 127, and 128. The administration's tortuous implementation of this legislation has revealed deeper concerns with the city's collection analysis and use of data. I would encourage the city to seize this opportunity to rethink how it handles data. There are so many benefits to New York City, especially around optimizing the delivery of services. Agencies that successfully handle data are improvements in efficiencies, see improvements in efficiencies and other operational metrics while increasing public satisfaction. The benefits also accrue to our nonprofit sector. With better data, organizations, especially those that serve our immigrant and LGBTQIA plus communities are able not only to improve their own outcomes, but to also present hard evidence of community needs to potential donors. Intro 1937 aims to close some of the loopholes in the original bills through expansion to all city agencies and the mandatory inclusion of questions on existing demographic forms unless prohibited by law. Of course, uh, constituent participation would be voluntary. I look forward to hearing from the administration and advocates on other ideas on how to improve the system particularly around increasing response rates and making the data that is collected more accessible. Thank you, Chair Cabrera. And I look forward to hearing from the administration on this legislation. Thank you so much, uh, Council Member Drum. And uh, I think you, got, you have a fantastic bill there. Uh, so with that, let me turn it over to Council Member uh, Denise Miller to give an opening statement on this bill. Okay, uh, I guess we could come back. Uh, so with that, let me, is council member- Can you hear Lander. me, Mr. Chair? Yes, I can hear you, thank you. Okay, thank you and good morning to you, sir. Uh, you. It has been a pleasure to work and serve with you over the past eight years and, and particularly uh, this committee, uh, governmental operations, obviously the Committee on Civil Service and Labor, we have done a lot of work together over the past years, and I'm so appreciative of this partnership. Uh, today, um, I wanna to talk about a bill that we've introduced 1901. In 1983, Deputy <clears throat> Mayor Nathan Leventhal issued a memorandum dividing the responsibilities of cleaning, the, the responsibilities uh, to clean and maintain certain city owned properties in the public right of way in between three agencies, Department of Sanitation, Transportation, and Parks and Recreation. In the four decades and five mayoral administrations since then, Leventhal memo, memo has faded from memory of most New Yorkers. To my knowledge, the Leventhal memo, 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 memo is not posted for public. And uh, this has caused much confusion in communities without a clear set of guidelines for public to understand the city's internal policy in respect to cleaning and maintaining these properties, mostly mediums and, and, and other public space. Yet the need for clarity and accountability has never been more pressing. The COVID-19 pandemic has highlighted the importance of public spaces, but unfortunately also their neglect. Bureaucratic confusion and lack of transparency has led to endless buck passing and finger pointing while littering and dumping has become more common. Truth is, we've all experienced some version of this endless bureaucratic feedback loop, loophole. A highway ramp no one has yet to clean, traffic mediums and islands overgrown with vegetation, underpass turned dumping grounds that no one will claim responsibility for. Out of desperation and frustration, and frustration with the city, community members and groups are now rolling up their sleeves on their own and, and, and shouldering the burden. We must do better. New York City's taxpayers are entitled to clear and efficient services. 
We in the council have made the first step and by bringing forth the 11th old memo for introduction 2409 for public discussion today. My understanding is that representations from DSNY, DOT and Department of Parks are all prepared to speak to this bill. I'm grateful for the administration's partnership. As you know, there's precious little time left for all, most of us here in, in, in this uh, call this morning, in this hearing this morning. So it is essential that we have a frank conversation today and move it forward. It is my expectations that we'll be able to pass a bill that will bring transparency and accountability to our communities and will help to keep our public space clean and well-maintained. Let us re re let me reiterate uh, my thanks to Chair Cabrera and the committee for your support uh, in moving this bill forward and to the many colleagues that, that have signed on. Let me also just mention um, that I have a um, great concern for intro 2429, 2453, and the other uh, CFB um, reforms that we'll be discussing this morning. So thank you again, Chair, for your leadership. Thank you for colleagues for signing on. Look forward to a uh, real discourse around this legislation. Thank you so much, uh, Council Member, for your leadership. This is an issue that I dealt with just even as early as this year, earlier this year. And it took me bringing the media, dealing with a situation specifically uh, to what you are addressing. So thank you. Thank you uh, for making a difference. Uh, this is going to really help our constituents and our provisional services. So with that, let me turn it over to Council Member Rosenthal. Great, thank you so much, Chair Cabrera. Um, my name is Helen Rosenthal. My pronouns are she and her. Um, I really appreciate you, Chair Cabrera, for holding this important hearing and for including my bill, Intro 2438, which will mandate the creation of more inclusive video voter guides. Intro 2438 2021 will require the New York City Campaign Finance Board to release video guides for voters with captions in English, American Sign Language, and the top six limited English proficiency languages spoken by the population of New York City. The guides will be produced for each candidate participating in local elections. To ensure that these inclusive steps are taken, my bill requires candidates in local office to participate in the video voter guides in order to receive matching campaign funds through the New York City's campaign finance program. New York City has taken important steps to ensure that city services and civic life are more accessible. Unfortunately, as I'm sure many people here can tell you today, we still have a long way to go. Information about candidates for office is currently provided to voters in a five language written guide. In requiring video voter guides, we are doing several important things. We are expanding the number of languages in which voters can receive this vital information and we're making it accessible to those with limited literacy ability. We are also profoundly changing the way candidates engage with voters by requiring them to communicate visually. The videos will have sign language translation along with captions for those of us who are deaf, hard of hearing, or just rely on captions for a myriad of reasons. We will open the door for a new community to be educated voters. Candidates will also be encouraged to visually describe themselves for people who are blind or low vision. My legislation mandates the creation of inclusive videos, but it also makes accessible voting information an ongoing priority. The Board of Elections will be required to work with the Mayor's Office for People with Disabilities to continue to meet co um, the constantly improving best practices in accessibility. Being a fully informed voter is a central part of, the, of civic life. We cannot afford to exclude or alienate any New Yorkers. In a time where voting rights are contested and barriers to voting are shamefully increasing, 
I'm proud that with this bill, New York City will be going in the opposite direction. We have been fortunate to already have received meaningful feedback from members of the disability community. They have identified important potential improvements for my bill, such as the need for guides printed in Braille. I want to thank Edward Friedman and the Mayor's Office for People with Disabilities for their assistance. I welcome your feedback and encourage anyone who was unable to submit testimony or appear today to please send written testimony to testimony at council.nyc.gov. If you are unable to email testimony but are able to make phone calls, please contact our EEO officers at 212-788-6936. Thank you. And I'll pass it back to Chair Cabrera. Thank you so much, Council Member, and thank you for such a timely uh, bill. Uh, it's much needed. Uh, and uh, you're advancing uh, a bill that, uh, especially when it comes to American Sign Language, uh, they often are disfranchised. So thank you for connecting all the dots here together. Much grateful. So with that, let me uh, turn it over uh, to our moderator, uh, Committee Council C.J. Murray to go over some procedural items. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I am C.J. Murray, Counsel to the Committee on Governmental Operations. Today's hearing will begin with four panels. Panel number one will include representatives from the Mayor's Office of Information Privacy, who will be testifying on introduction number 2459. Panel number two will include representatives from the New York City Campaign Finance Board, who will be testing, uh, testifying on today's oversight topic as well as introductions 1901, 2453, 2429, and 2438. Panel number three will include a representative from the Mayor's Office of Operations, who will be testifying on introduction number 1937. And panel number four will include representatives from the Departments of Sanitation, Transportation, and Parks and Recreation, who will be testifying on introduction number 2409. All members of the public who have signed up to testify today will be invited to testify after panel number four. After each panel, there will be time for council member questions. During the hearing, if a council member would like to ask a question, please use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you in order. We will be limiting council member questions to five minutes, which includes the time it takes the panelists to answer your question. Please note that for ease of this virtual hearing, there will not be a second round of questioning outside of questions from the bill sponsors and the committee chair. Before we begin testimony, I want to remind our panelists that you will be on mute until you are called on to testify, at which point you will be unmuted by a member of our staff. All hearing participants may submit written testimony to testimony at council.nyc.gov. We'll now hear from our first panel representing the Mayor's Office of Information Privacy. Our panelists will include Chief Privacy Officer, Laura Negron, Principal Senior Counsel, Aaron Friedman, and Senior Counsel for Legislative Affairs, Becky Blatt. Before we begin testimony, I will administer the oath. Panelists, please raise your right hand. I will read the oath once and then call on each of you individually for a response. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Chief Privacy Officer Negron. Yes, I do. Principal Senior Counsel Friedman. Senior Counsel Blatt. Yes, I do. Thank you. You may begin your testimony. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Cabrera and members of the Committee on Governmental Operations. My name is Laura Negron. I am the Chief Privacy Officer for the City of New York and Head of the Mayor's Office of Information Privacy. I am joined today by my colleagues, Principal Senior Counsel, Aaron Friedman, and Senior Counsel for Legislative Affairs, Becky Blatt. We greatly appreciate this opportunity to discuss codifying our office within the New York City Charter and the important role we provide in advising city agencies on privacy law and best practices. I am also excited to share more about the critical work that we do every day to manage and implement the city's privacy policies and mandates, and most importantly, to protect the privacy of New Yorkers' personal and sensitive information in their interactions with city government. 
As background, the City Council established the Chief Privacy Officer role in 2017 by passing Local Law 245. A companion law, Local Law 247, mandated the creation of a comprehensive citywide privacy protection framework. These laws together gave the chief privacy officer the power and duty to develop and implement the first set of citywide privacy protection policies and protocols and to advise city agencies on federal, state and local privacy law among other duties and powers. In 2018, the mayor named me as the city's first chief privacy officer and pursuant to Executive Order 34, recognizing the importance of this work, established the Mayor's Office of Information Privacy. Today, as a team of six attorneys, we report directly to the Mayor's Council and serve as a centralized privacy resource for city agencies, supporting a network of 175 agency privacy officers. Safeguarding the privacy of individuals' personal information that has been entrusted to local government is essential to the effective delivery of city services, such as healthcare, education, public safety, cash assistance, legal services, housing, and other services. This is especially important for vulnerable populations whose sensitive information in the wrong hands can cause irreparable, and in some cases, catastrophic personal and financial harm. Privacy protection is also an important driver of equity, considering the diverse populations who are so often the applicants and recipients of city services. Toward these goals, our privacy team continues to support and oversee citywide compliance with the extensive set of standards and legal requirements governing the protection of identifying information by local government today. Then, as now, we also remain committed to advancing important multi-agency data sharing initiatives with the goal of improving the quality and coordination of services delivered to all New Yorkers while ensuring vigilant data privacy and security practices. As examples, our team helped to design and negotiate legal privacy strategies and agreements to implement priority citywide initiatives, such as pre-K and 3K programs, the 2020 census and citywide healthcare enrollment, to name just a few. And throughout the pandemic, we helped to ensure, working closely with our agency partners and city hall, that emergency response and recovery efforts involving New Yorkers' personal information, such as contact tracing, emergency financial services to immigrant populations ineligible for government assistance, and the vaccine rollout were designed and implemented through the lens of privacy. Each of these efforts has been in furtherance of the city's goals of ensuring New Yorkers can safely receive the right services and resources at the right time. The work we do in protecting privacy extends to our contracted providers. In addition to privacy protection and contracts and subcontracts for human services required by existing law, in 2021, as chief privacy officer, I designated certain technology and outreach contracts as requiring additional privacy protections and issued new agency guidance and resources to protect privacy in other contracts involving sensitive identifying information. These new requirements went into effect in July of this year. As a key strategic advisor to city agencies and the administration on complex legal privacy issues, our privacy team also serves an important role in advancing the administration's broader policy and advocacy work on privacy protection. We draft and comment on behalf of the city on proposed local, state, and federal legislation and regulations relating to privacy, and we also educate and train city employees about privacy laws and best practices. In the weeks ahead, we will be launching together with the city's Department of Administrative Services, the first ever baseline citywide privacy training for all city employees. Importantly, as an increasing number of health and human services and commercial transactions increasingly use digital methods to collect and transmit individuals' personal information or even require it, the demands for even more sophisticated forms of privacy protection have grown exponentially. These electronic transactions carry new risks, especially given the proliferation of sophisticated bad actors for whom New York City is an attractive target. In this environment, we must as a city be able to retain the confidence of New Yorkers who trust that their information is being appropriately handled both privately and securely in the delivery of services and resources. As such, our team works with city agencies and officials to provide the privacy expertise needed in the face of these challenges. 
In closing, I want to reiterate our commitment to both advancing privacy protection and supporting the important interagency data sharing work that can better serve New Yorkers, institutionalizing our role as a critical partner in solutioning some of today's most complex information protection challenges as set forth in introduction 2459 will enable us to continue serving in this capacity as a core function of city government. The city must continue to prioritize protecting the privacy and security of New Yorkers personal data, particularly for our most vulnerable populations as we grow, evolve and remain nimble yet protective as a government. Thank you very much for your time and consideration. We look forward to our continued conversations on this important topic and my colleagues and I are happy to answer any questions. Well, thank you so much uh, for your testimony. I, I just have a, a few questions and I'll turn it over to uh, my colleagues if they have any questions. Uh, as a matter of fact, I'm gonna put all three questions into one. Uh, can you share with us uh, the office work to uh, evolve in the future, uh, how has the COVID-19 pandemic impacted the work of the uh, mayor's office of information privacy? And are we gonna need additional resources to implement introduction number 2459? Thank you for your questions. Um, no additional resources are being requested to implement 2459. We have a team of six attorneys and I, I do believe we have um, accomplished a significant amount of centralized privacy resource work in the past three and three plus years. Um, and we plan to continue uh, serving the city and, the, and, the, uh, and New Yorkers with the existing resources that we have. Um, with respect to the pandemic, uh, I would say the challenges, uh, you know, obviously felt citywide were that emergency services and responses were required on a, in a you know, imminent basis. And so there is a lot of uh, sensitive personal information on the move um, that was necessary to be shared in order to implement and deliver emergency services um, to, to New Yorkers. Uh, in that regard, we were called to the table and we were partners at the table to ensure that as sensitive information traveled among and between agencies in order to deliver these services, such as, for example, the city's Get Food program, uh, the city's get cool program to deliver air conditioners, um, contact tracing programs that as information travel, we were there to advise on the, on the um, applicable laws and regulations that govern privacy and to figure out creative solutions, but responsible and privacy compliance solutions to ensure that the information traveled only into to authorize users for the limited purpose that it was necessary to deliver the services and to limit the amount of information being shared in order to deliver those services effectively. I don't know if I missed any questions there, but was there a third question I, that you had? Yeah, it's regarding uh, to the office work uh, to evolve in the future. How, how do you see it? Where do you see it going? I think you mentioned something that you're planning on already, uh, but is there anything else? How do you see an office evolving? Um, well, we hope to do more of the same. And again, as a core function of city government, uh, as I mentioned, uh, we are rolling out the city's first baseline privacy training for all city employees, unless there's an exemption, um, that's probably going to be a, a rare case. Um, this is a baseline tra training for all city employees and we, we, look, we are looking to develop um, a more advanced form of privacy training for, for employees who handle um, sensitive identifying information on a more uh, frequent basis, such as attorneys and human resources professionals. Uh, so we, we are planning to develop that in, in, the, in the coming years ahead. And I think um, the, just the complexity of challenges that agencies fa face now in an increasingly electronic space, um, we are going to continue to work with our partners at um, Cyber Command and do it, our law department colleagues and City Hall to ensure that we are, we are there, we're ready, we're um, up to date on, on uh, changing laws and regulations and we can be the best resource we can for to support our city agencies and New Yorkers uh, in protecting their information. Well, thank you so much uh, for what you do. Uh, my, my only concern I have to tell you that I have, and it's not directly related to your office, but it's, it will impact what you do, is, the, is, is when it comes to cybersecurity, 
we are we are not hiring because of our low paying salaries. I'm not talking about the entry position in cyber uh, security at the high end. I, I think that we're making ourselves a bit vulnerable in the future uh, for sensitive information. Uh, and I, I hope it doesn't come to bite us one of these days. When I talk to, when I talk to different people in cybersecurity, uh, the private sector is way ahead of us. Uh, and they tell me they don't want to work for government because the higher end positions, they just don't pay. So this is something that we're definitely going to have to look at uh, in the future. And hopefully the next council and the next administration um, will, will give more attention. Again, that's kind of us, but it, it, it does impact uh, definitely what you do. And so with that, uh, let me turn it over to the committee council. Uh, for questions from my colleagues, if we have any, if not, we'll go to panel number two. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I'll now call on council members in the order they have used the Zoom raise hand function. Council members, if you'd like to ask a question and you've not yet raised your hand, please do so now. And Chair, I'm not seeing any uh, hands raised, so um, unless you have any other questions, we'll move on to the next panel. No, 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 I don't. And Chief, thank you. Thank you for all you do. Uh, thank you for your team uh, and, and for, uh, for all you do. We're much appreciated for your time. Thank you so much. All right. So with that, we go to panel number two. Thank you, Chair. Uh, we'll now hear from our second panel representing the New York City Campaign Finance Board. Our panelists will include CFP, CFB Chair Frederick Schaefer, Executive Director Amy Loprest and Assistant Executive Director for Public Affairs Eric Friedman. Before we begin, I will administer the oath. Panelists, please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Chair Schaefer? Yes, I do. Executive Director Loprest? I do. Assistant Executive Director Friedman? Yes, I do. Thank you. You may begin your testimony. Good morning. Uh, my name is Frederick Schaefer. I'm chair of the New York City Campaign Finance Board. With me today is Executive Director Amy Loprest and Assistant Executive Director for Public Affairs, Eric Friedman. Uh, chair Cabrera and members of the New York City uh, Council Committee on Government Operations, we thank you for the opportunity to testify today on four bills being considered by the committee, intro number 1901 and intro number 2453, sponsored by council member Lander, intro number 2438, sponsored by council member Rosenthal, and intro number 2429, sponsored by council member Yeager. Ms. Lopress will address the first three of these bills, and I will address the fourth. Ms. Lopress, would you take it from here? Thank you, Chair Cabrera. Thank you, Chair Schaefer. Um, uh, Chair Cabrera, I want to also thank you for your uh, great leadership on this committee over the past four years, and wish you wish you the best uh, in your future endeavors. Um, it's been a pleasure working with you and your staff. Um, on intros 1901 and 2453 would mitigate the impact of independence in expenditures in our elections and create more rigorous disclosure requirements for spending on behalf of ballot proposals. Since voters approved a 2010 ballot measure to require disclosure of outside spending in city elections, the council has frequently revised the independent expenditure laws. And as a result, New York City has some of the strongest requirements in the nation for disclosure of contributors to independent spenders. While there were fewer independent expenditures in city council races than in 2013, the mayor's race saw nearly $31.8 million in outside spending, the most amount in city history in the 2021 elections. Federal laws and the Citizens United decision restrict the city's ability to fully address the impact of independent expenditures. However, public funds and particularly the increased matching rate helped candidates to even out the imbalances brought by independent spenders and spread their messages directly to voters. Intro 1901, sponsored by Councilmember Lander, would require entities that make independent expenditures 
related to ballot proposals to disclose the identities of their contributors and to display paid for by notices on their materials. Both requirements currently apply to independent spending regarding candidates, but not ballot proposals. Independent spenders on ballot proposals are currently only required to disclose their contributors to the State Board of Elections. And intro 1901 would require spenders to disclose to the CFB as well. Around $1.4 million was spent supporting or opposing ballot proposals in 2018 and 2019, and this bill would provide transparency to voters about who is ultimately funding those independent expenditures. The CFB strongly supports requiring contributor disclosure for independent spending on ballot proposals. Intro 2453, also sponsored by Councilmember Lander, would provide participating candidates facing independent expenditures in their district with the ability to spend additional private funds in response. This would provide additional capacity for candidates to respond if they are being opposed by independent groups and continue to encourage public matching funds program participation. As you know, participants in the matching funds program must limit their spending. As drafted, the bill increases the spending limit to 150% for all races and the candidates in the race if independent expenditures exceed 50% of the spending limit or eliminates the spending limit if independent expenditures exceed 300% of the spending limit. This mirrors current law, which provides expenditure limit relief to participating candidates when they are opposed by high spending non-participants. Currently, candidates do not have the ability to spend above the limit to counter an independent spender. If, high spending, if a higher spending limit for all candidates is the remedy, it should be applied under limited circumstances. Using the lower threshold identified in the bill, which grants release at 50% of the spending limit, 21 city council districts would have had their spending limits increased in 2021 primary and three districts in the 2021 general election. Given that more than half of all competitive primary, council election, primary election council races would have had a spending limit increase under this threshold, the council should consider raising the threshold to ensure a spending limit increase occurs infrequently. The upper threshold set in the bill is appropriate and would be reached very rarely. The CFB supports both measures to strengthen our system's response to independent expenditures. We look forward to working with council staff on specific improvements to the language of both bills. The voter guide is supportive of any measure that makes our democracy accessible to a greater number of voters. Our own analysis has shown that neighborhoods with limited English proficiency and a high number of residents with disabilities often have lower voter participation compared to other neighborhoods across New York City. Nonpartisan, trustworthy voting information is important, more important now than ever before, given the attack, recent attacks on the credibility of elections. Our government should do everything it can to involve more New Yorkers in the political process, and we believe the Voter Guide serves this purpose by providing voters with the information that they need to participate. Councilmember Rosenthal's bill would do several things to expand access and standardize the Voter Guide. First, it would expand access for multilingual speakers by requiring the CFB to provide video voter guide content in the designated citywide languages. The CFB has already made it standard practice to include ASL interpretation for all video voter guide profiles and to translate each video voter guide skip into federal voting right act languages, which this bill would also codify into law. We must make a sound investment in language accessibility moving forward, and the CFB recommends this bill go farther and require both the print and online voter guides to be translated into the designated citywide languages. To ensure consistency, the law should match language coverage between all voter guide formats. Translating the various voter guide formats into six additional languages will require additional contracting and staffing, but the CFB believes it will be more than worthwhile to provide access to more voters. Next, the bill would also standardize production of the voter guide in two media formats. Currently, the online voter guide is produced for elections with municipal, with municipal, state, or federal candidates on the ballot, but a printed voter guide is only produced for elections with municipal candidates or ballot proposals. This bill would require the production of a printed and online guide for every primary and general election, including for state and federal offices. A twice yearly production schedule would necessitate greater spending on contracting 
inclusive of design, formatting, and producing, as well as hiring additional full-time staff. We look forward to working with council staff to implement these changes. Intro number 2438 would also require candidates to participate in the video voter guide in order to receive public matching funds. While it is essential that all voters can learn about the candidates on their ballot in multiple formats that are accessible, we do have concerns about adding an additional hurdle for participating candidates. There, already, there is already a consequence for not participating in the video and print voter guide. Candidates miss out on the opportunity to reach voters at no cost to their campaign. We believe this sufficiently entices candidates to provide voter guide profiles on time in place of withholding public funds. The timeline of public funds payments and voter guide due dates also poses a problem. We begin making payments to candidates in December the year preceding the election. Typically, we ask candidates to submit their profile and script several months later, which allows candidates to make their statements relevant and responsive to changing concerns in their district. Keeping to this timeline would present complications for candidates who receive matching funds but fail to submit a voter guide profile and script by the deadline. We applaud the council's commitment to expanding access to the voter guide and look forward to further discussing how we can meet the spirit of this bill by also ensuring it does not inadvertently discourage participation in the public matching funds program. Thank you, I'll pick it up from here on the uh, issue of the uh, budget process. The CFB opposes intro number 2429, which would change the agency's budget process. The CFB's budget process, as provided in the New York City Charter, insulates the board from external political pressure and has allowed the board to exercise its responsibilities in a nonpartisan, independent manner. The Charter makes it clear that the mayor does not have authority to make unilateral changes to the CFB budget. While the stated rationale for this legislation is to increase transparency, it is the existing budget process in the charter that ensures changes to the CFB budget are implemented with the full cooperation of the city council in an open, transparent manner. Currently, the CFB is required to submit its budget estimate to the mayor on March 10th. Section 1052C of the Charter requires the mayor to include the CFB's budget estimates unaltered in the executive budget transmitted to the council. If the mayor wishes to exercise influence over the CFB's budget, the Charter provides an avenue to do so, allowing the mayor to include any such recommendations as deemed proper. <clears throat> Though the charter only requires the CFB to submit its proposed budget for inclusion in the executive budget, in past years, the CFB has provided information and testified at the council's preliminary budget hearings. In the future, the board continues to be willing to participate at the council's request. The CFB has appeared every year at the council's budget hearings. At these hearings, council members have ample opportunity to question the CFB about the agency's budget estimate. Like every other part of the executive budget, the council has the authority to adopt the CFB's budget as submitted or to amend it. These protections against political influence were put on the ballot by the 1998 Charter Revision Commission and approved by city voters, and they should remain in place. The council may not intend to undermine the independence of the board with this legislation. However, past experience here and in other jurisdictions suggest that this legislation may well be perceived as an attack on the board's independence. In 1998, former Mayor Rudy Giuliani attempted to interfere with the CFB's operations, blocking payments to candidates and trying to move the agency to an office space inadequate to the agency's needs. These actions were likely motivated by his opposition to implementing a city council law, increasing the public matching funds program to a $4 to $1 matching ratio. A more recent out of state example of political interference with an independent nonpartisan election and oversight body is the dissolution of the Wisconsin Government Accountability Board. After the board conducted an investigation into coordination between Governor Scott Walker 
and outside groups during the 2012 recall election in Wisconsin, he signed a bill passed by the Republican controlled legislature to disband the GAB. The bill does not grant new powers to the council, but gives the mayor additional power to dictate the CFB's budget. While there may not be a threat today or in a month or in a year, the budget protections in the charter may be needed 10 years from now or 25 years from now. The lessons of history suggest they will someday be necessary to preserve the matching funds program and the city's nonpartisan voter engagement work. New York City has made a unique contribution to fostering and supporting a healthy, inclusive democracy at the local level. It includes efforts across multiple agencies, including ours, to provide resources that help candidates run for office and include underrepresented voters more completely in our city's civic life. City lawmakers have long valued this mission as a priority and created protections for it to ensure that candidates and voters will have consistent access to resources and support, regardless of any change in the political landscape. While the charter currently provides that protection, it also makes space for oversight from the mayor and the council. The charter gives both bodies the tools necessary to provide rigorous oversight while also ensuring the CFB is not impacted by political pressures. In conclusion, the CFB is grateful for the opportunity to provide testimony on the four bills being considered by this committee today. Increasing transparency and disclosure of outside spending and making elections information more accessible are essential to encouraging strong civic participation in New York City. The CFB is supportive of these overriding principles in intros 1901, 2453, and 2438. We look forward to working with the council staff on the language of these important pieces of legislation. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify. We are happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you so much, uh, Chair Chafer, Director Lopez. Uh, I first want to take a moment uh, to thank you all and also Eric Freeman for the many talks that we had had uh, during the last four years. Thank you for your partnership. Uh, it, it made uh, uh, doing this chairmanship all the more rewarding. And so with that, actually, uh, what I'm going to do now, instead of asking questions, uh, I'm going to turn it over to my colleagues and I'll come with questions at the end. Since it's my last one, let me let me pass on the goodwill here. And so, um, so let me turn it over to our moderator. I uh, and he'll be calling out uh, my colleagues. Thank you, Chair. Uh, first, we'll hear from Councilmember Lander, followed by Councilmember Rosenthal, and then Councilmember Yeager. Councilman Member Lander. Thank you so much, Chair Cabrera. Thank you for that generous uh, last meeting offer. Thank you for your service as chair of this committee where you really have done a great job and it's been an honor uh, serving with you. Uh, I wanna also say thank you to the CFB and their representatives. Um, you know, As I come to the end of my time in office, I am really proud of the work that we have done together as stewards of the campaign finance system. Uh, I've looked each time to your post-election reports uh, together, we strengthen independent expenditure disclosure um, in a kind of first in class way that I think has made a real difference in letting voters know. And I'll tell you that I actually heard there were a couple of independent expenditures that supported me in my recent election. And after the election was over, the folks who did them complained to me about the disclosure requirements, uh, to which my answer was great. You didn't have to do the IEs at all. That's what I really want is let's get rid of <laughs> IEs altogether. But if we're gonna have them, we at least need first in class disclosure. And I really appreciate the work we've done together uh, to achieve that. Um, you know, and I believe our system really improves our democracy. And you can see that in the next council, I'm so excited about this great, diverse, independent, ideologically diverse, uh, demographically diverse city council coming in. And I know that when we do the post-election report here, we will really see the ways in which the system has helped us have a better democracy. So I'll just say I'm on record as an opponent of intro 2429. I do believe that in the independent budget process, uh, as the chair just outlined, is critical for preserving um, the independence of the board and its ability, even though sometimes candidates find it a headache, 
uh, to really secure uh, a, a democracy full of integrity and elections full of integrity. So um, uh, thank you for your support of intro 1901. Um, uh, and I want to note that um, I see Council Member Danique Miller on. He and I are proud co-sponsors of expanding the disclosure requirements to ballot propositions. We disagreed on the ballot proposition of ranked choice voting on which there were IEs but we're strongly aligned uh, that there needs to be full disclosure of all spending. So I'm proud that, you know, across that difference on the ballot proposition, we agree with intro 1901 and thank you for your support. Um, however, I have some questions about my own bill. I, I appreciate your broad support of 2453, but I uh, had that bill drafted prior to seeing the impact of the expanded matching fund requirements. And I really have a lot of questions about whether it'll achieve the goal of helping us uh, confront the challenges of independent expenditures, given that we're not allowed to simply eliminate them under federal law. So I have a couple of questions because I think it might be that this bill needs some more refinement. And I don't know that I think we can get that done by the end of the year. So first, I just wanna make sure I, you know, it's clear. The bill as drafted uh, and as required for constitutional muster uh, would raise the spending ceiling for all the candidates in the race, those that benefited from independent expenditure spending and those whom it was spent against, correct? Yes, that's correct. So it's not exactly comparable to what happens in the case where you're facing a high spender. If your opponent busts the limits and your limit is then raised, that's essentially leveling the playing field. You get closer to offsetting their funding. But in this case, it wouldn't level the playing field. It just would boost the limit for everyone, both the beneficiaries and the opponents of the independent expenditures, correct? Yeah, what it would allow is that the, you know, the people who are participating in the program to spend more to, you know, to counter those messages and get their message out. But then the the candidates, you know, assuming the candidate who's you know benefiting from the IE is participating in the system, they would also get more. This is just an everybody gets more. Correct. Yes. yes. And then I'm all, I also to clarify, you wouldn't get matching funds above the original ceiling up to the new higher ceiling. Correct. Yes. Yeah, so the bill would not provide any additional matching funds um, that would be uh, would not survive constitutional muster. That's right. I mean, I, I would be glad to do it, but it's my sense that the constitution we that would be viewed as uh, uh, unconstitutional relative to sort of um, as a because it would be disadvantaging the IEs, and therefore we don't. There's no matching funds, and you would be allowed to go above the limit, small dollar, but of course without matching funds. Um, you, you essentially have an incentive to raise in larger dollar amounts. You don't get the matching funds. And so you would imagine, you're just thinking about the incentives a candidate has if their ceiling is raised, there certainly would not be any incentive small dollar. And you might even argue that there were incentives to raise lar through large dollar contributions, correct? That's correct. Although, the, I mean, the council did great work in, you know, in lowering the, con the contribution limits across the board, you know, for this past election. So the contribution limits are relatively lower than they were in the past or, and, you know, compared to other jurisdictions. Yeah. Now, and one research question, and this is part of why I think I, my hunch is that we're, we probably can't get this done in the time we have remaining this term. I, I would want to know whether there was any correlation between candidates who had independent expenditure spending on their behalf and whether those candidates were more likely to have higher dollar contribution averages. There's no, we don't know for sure, but you might guess that people who had high spending outside interests wanting to do IEs for them might also have higher dollar average contributions. Is there any research on the contribution averages of candidates for whom there was independent expenditure spending for and against? You know, as you said, we've only just started our work in the post-election analysis, but that is a very interesting question and would probably require additional research to, to know. Because if it were the case that candidates who had that had IE spending on their behalf also had higher dollar contribution averages, you might conclude that they would be benefiting more from raising the ceiling because they could raise more money faster with their higher dollar campaign averages. 
And certainly I would not, that, that would give me pause as to whether this approach made sense. So, um, I, you know, I think it would be great to do that research. So I guess let me ask you as part of your post-election research, if you could conduct that research, but, but understanding that it probably can't be done on a time scale that would make it possible to incorporate that information into this bill. Um, I'm gonna sit after this hearing with whether I think we can uh, amend this bill. I appreciate your suggestions of raising the thresholds, which I think are good ones. Um, but I have to think about whether I think we can get this done in a way that would really merit, you know, it, this merits full scrutiny and it might be that we need your post-election report and the next council has to take this up and figure out the best. Yeah. I mean, I think that is a very interesting question and that definitely is something that we will add to our list of research questions for the post-election report. Wonderful. Okay, uh, I will leave it there. Thank you very much for your time, Chair. Again, thank you so much for deferring to us. Um, I hope everyone, uh, you know, thank you for this last hearing and for all your leadership. Thank you, Council Member. Next, we'll hear from Council Member Rosenthal, followed by Council Member Yeager, and then Council Member Miller. Council Member Rosenthal. Thank you so much. Um, I'd like to talk about the video voter guide. Um, and I want to start with just three quick points. Uh, should this bill pass, which I hope it does, uh, these have to do with rulemaking. Um, first of all, I just wanted to confirm that CFB right now overlays the five, I think, different languages. Is that right? Just yes, real quick. So so the way the video appears in the translated script based on yeah. what language you've chosen appears underneath it. Great. So it's five, right? Five languages? Yes, five. Yeah, thank you. Um, again, this is, would be for rulemaking. Could, would it be possible to make sure that the same ASL interpreter would uh, be there for each title? or city council district. In other words, so we don't run into the problem of different ASL interpreters doing their work perhaps in different ways for different mayoral candidates. Could you have the same interpreter for all mayoral candidates? The same, perhaps a different one, but of that different one, the same for all public advocate candidates, the same interpreter for all district six, candidates, et cetera. Is that possible? Um, I am. I think that's a, something that definitely we can look into. Um, or, uh, Mr. Freeman, do you have any sense I, of whether or and not- And I mention it okay. just because it's a concern raised by the deaf and hard enough hearing community. And if we could, un, yeah, thank you. So we can definitely look into that. Thank you. Okay, and then lastly, could you, again, in your rulemaking, encourage those who do not participate in the matching program that they still do the video, right? Yes, I mean, so right. we do, we definitely encourage everyone to participate yes. in both the voter guide and the video voter guide, um, and you know, send numerous reminders. And so, yes, I mean, definitely something that's important to have everyone. So in. here are my two questions. It sounds, it sounds to me like CFB really has two concerns. One is about the timeline, which is that the filming schedule doesn't fit the matching fund schedule. The matching fund schedule comes first. But couldn't you resolve that by simply requiring the candidates to make a commitment or to send you a draft, uh, you know, speech that would be, you know, totally made up that they could change 100%, but send in that draft speech prior to getting the first round of CFB matching funds? In other words, you know, you know, we are releasing these funds with the understanding that you are going to do a video voter guide of some sort. Yep. Would that be possible? Um, you know, again, yes, of course, that would be possible. The The question is what happens when, um, if someone fails to submit. And so that, you know, that is our concern is that sure. you know, we don't want to disadvantage someone by giving them the funds and then having them, you know, not, you know, not Just, the require, you know, the requirements. In other words, so what I'm suggesting is if they promise to do the video and then you give them the matching funds and they don't do the video, I'm suggesting, could you then 
take back those matching funds or not make the next distribution of funds? Um, you know, certainly we can attempt to take back the matching funds. Of course, as you know, you know, funds will, you know, once received, people spend them. So uh, they, they may not be available to be refunded, and, but certainly we could not make the next, you know, any additional payments. That's certainly mm -hmm. a possibility. But you could ask them to sign on the dotted line, right? Yes. Um, yeah. but, but again, you know, we don't want to, I mean, it, it, it would be difficult to, you know, ask people for money back. It always is. <laughs> Yeah. Let's do that. So um, let me ask you, uh, you stay right and you assert that the existence of the video voter guide is enough to incentivize candidates to participate. How many candidates do you know did not participate in the video voter guides? So, so I, 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 I can share the numbers uh, if, if that's okay. So for the 2021 primary, um, we had about a 73% participation rate in the video voter guide. It's 274 uh, out of 375 candidates on the ballot. Um, for the general election, it was roughly the same, a little bit more than 70%. 99 out of 139 candidates um, participated in the video voter guide for the, for the general. Um, the participation rates, just, just for comparison, in the print voter guide, that is the written profiles, um, are a little bit higher. So for the 2021 primary, we had 89% participation, 332 candidates um, out of the 375 on the ballot gave us written profiles. Uh, in the general and election, it's 116 at 139. Um, so look, the, the platform that we're able to provide candidates is, is, is a strong incentive for candidates to participate. Um, you know, the print guide is, is, is in every mailbox uh, with a home with a registered voter. Um, we had really great visibility for that, those online profiles with the videos. Um, you know, about, about more than half a million views uh, before the primary, a little less before the general. Um, so it, it's a broad platform. Candidates, um, you know, again, have a lot of incentive to, to participate because we're providing this platform for free. Um, and so our participation has been, has been strong. So I guess what my fundamental question is, does government think deaf people should participate in voting? And if the answer is yes, the question is, is government going to ensure that every candidate have an ASL interpreter and do a video voter guide? Um, you know, I, what I hear, and, and I'm very familiar with the 2019 pilot that CFB did with ASL interpreters, which was a great success for those who participated, that the real issue here is funding. And that OMB has said, OMB, which is a simply the budget arm for the mayor's office, so it's not like in other words, they're reflecting a policy of the current mayor saying no funding or limited funding for ASL interpreters. If that were not an issue, if OMB was not saying you can't have the money or you only have limited money for ASL, would that change your testimony at all? Um, so, you know, we, d in 2021, we did indeed have ASL interpreters for, uh, and we intend to in continue to uh, include that as part of our budget request, because we do agree with you the, the importance of having the ASL interpreters, uh, you know, for uh, the deaf community. So again, that is, you know, we do in include that and do consider it important. And of course, having that in legislation, you know, makes it codified in legislation makes it even a stronger, you know, uh, uh, commitment to the deaf community. Thank you. I appreciate that because you don't want to have deaf people only voting for people who have a video voter guide. They might, there might be somebody else who's terrific, but chose not to do a video voter guide for some reason. 
Um, and right, so you know where I am. Um, thank you for that. I think that's it. Um, uh, okay, I think that's, those are my questions. If you have any other concerns, uh, I'd appreciate your letting me know, but it sounds like the hurdles you've raised are easily overcomable. Um, and I look forward to hearing the testimony or reading the testimony um, from the community. Thank you so much. Unless you have anything else to add, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, thank you very much. And we look forward to working with you. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Next, we'll hear from Council Member Yeager, followed by Council Member Miller. Council Member Yeager. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, since we're on the topic, uh, just very briefly on Council Member Rosenthal's introduction, 2438, um, it would seem to me that, you know, if, if the uh, hurdle is money, uh, and this would be something that, as it stands right now, is completely within the purview of the Campaign Finance Board, because Campaign Finance Board says what it needs to spend and tells the mayor this is what it's going to spend, and then the mayor simply inserts the CFB's budget demand, not request, uh, into the budget without being changed. So this, if anything, um, uh, A, raises a question of whether the CFB uh, prioritizes this, as Council Member Rosenthal has uh, questioned. And also, um, it may be another reason why um, my introduction should pass so that the CFB comes before us during the preliminary budget process and an enterprising council member uh, may want to question whether the CFB is planning to spend a sufficient amount of money on the translation. Uh, but what I would also point out, um, which may be counterintuitive because this would go against, I guess, the intent of this bill. Um, as it stands right now, a candidate who wishes to participate in the voter guide has to submit a script in advance to the CFB and may not deviate from that script. Um, uh, the script is subject to CFB staff uh, editing, uh, censorship, if you will. And I say this, this is not a challengeable statement because uh, this happened to me four years ago. I submitted my draft script. The circumstances of my race, uh, as is known in the public domain, changed. I desired to change the statement that I was going to video. I hadn't done it yet. And CFB staff told me, no, I could not deviate from the script, not one word. And therefore, I declined to participate in the video voter guide. Um, having uh, went, gone through that experience four years ago, I chose this year to simply take myself out of the mix of doing the video, voting, the video voter guide because I didn't want to submit myself to the censorship of CFB staff and uh, the decisions that the staff would make about whether or not what I said was OK and if I decided to change what I wanted to say. Um, I'm a politician. Sometimes I decide what I want to say on the fly. It gets me in trouble sometimes. Sometimes people like it, but that's the way it works. We get to say what we want to say, and uh, you folks shouldn't have the right to censor what we want to say. Um, so I think that uh, uh, this, the entire process by which the CFB does the video voter guide should certainly be looked at, but certainly I don't believe that the CFB staff should have the right to review, to edit, to change, to, uh, to suggest with regard to what a candidate uh, wishes to say in his or her video statement. Um, uh, Councilman Lander's introduction 2453, which I spoke about in my opening remarks and I support it. Um, uh, I just wanna point out that as currently drafted, as I said earlier, um, the, the trigger is three times uh, the amount of the spending by the independent entity. And in a council race that would amount to uh, that the candidate doesn't get relief until the independent entity has spent $723,000. And in a mayoral race, uh, it would not kick in until uh, the entity has spent $22.8 million. I think those thresholds are too high. Um, I, you know, Again, I said at the beginning, I don't speak for Councilman Lander, but I do believe that uh, there are ways to make this better. I, I think that, um, uh, and there are constitutionally accepted ways to make this better in keeping with Ognebeni, uh the decision of the Second Circuit, because I don't believe uh, that that uh, freeing another candidate to to be uh, freeing them from the from the campaign finance limits would be a constitutionally problematic 
uh, issue because the, the Second Circuit said it was okay. It was only the influx of public funds triggered by someone else's spending that was problematic. And I agree with, uh, 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 the, with Council Melander that this does not uh, in, implicate any public funds whatsoever. However, I do believe that we must, we must, we must give candidates who are facing high spending, non-participating opponents, including IEs, the ability to uh, have the cap lifted so that they could run the campaign and speak to the voters without all the noise created by these high spending, non-participating entities. And in the past, we've always considered a high spending non-participant to be a person running. I think we have to expand that and it must include an independent entity. So if you have any comment on that, uh, I'll pause. Yeah, we, we agree with that. I, that, you know, again, that, 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 I mean, it's that this, that there should be, you know, an increase in uh, the spending limit when there is high, when there are independent spenders. I think, you know, we can obviously spend some time doing research and discuss, you know, what the appropriate thresholds are for triggering okay. that. But, but can we agree, Director, that as, as just as a preliminary matter, that at least the three times is just too high? That, uh, you know, I don't want to, uh, I don't want to bully you into anything. I, you know, if it's not your position, it's not your position. But I just want to know if you if you have any uh, threshold number that you think is, I mean, is three times too high or just you're not ready to say yet? And that's OK if you're not ready to say yet. I mean, we're not quite ready to say. I mean, I, you know, I guess, you know, looking the bill as written has a, you know, two tier cap, like uh, uh, that two, two triggers like the um, that two thresholds as the. Um, we do for high spending non-participant people. Um, and so again, we think maybe the the uh, tr the threshold for the lower lifting is a little too low. Um, and so you know, but I think you know talking about where right where the threshold should be right in, you know might be you know somewhere in between, you know, the 50% lifting and the uh, uh, the 300 percent. You know, there's probably somewhere in between that would be the perfect spot for lifting the spending limit altogether. I, I would just say that that the two tier limit, uh, the two tier threshold as as currently uh, operational for uh, candidates and their opponents who are also candidates. Uh, in my in my particular circumstances, four years ago, I was facing a uh, non participating high spender um, whose whose high spending uh, only triggered the first piece of the relief, which meant that I was able to go out and raise another $100,000 in the last several weeks before the election. Um, and those, those are problematic, first of all, because at the end of the campaign, the high spending non-participant had still spent two to three times more than me, uh, several hundred thousand uh, dollars more. Uh, secondly, because by the time that the, that, that trigger was enacted, we already knew that we were being outspent, but the actual trigger hadn't exceeded 150%. And I was still restricted in what I could spend on my own campaign because of that. And I think that those triggers need to be looked at as well. And the reason is not merely, in my view at least, and again, I'm not speaking for the bill sponsor, only speaking for myself, but it's not merely to, to give a candidate relief from, from a cap, but it's also to, I hope, encourage those who want to bust the cap not to knowing that a candidate will then be able to go out and respond if they have the capacity to do so. And I think what we've seen is uh, some of these independent groups um, and also high, high spending non-participants going out there and spending, knowing that they can keep their opponents uh, from being able to respond because the cap is artificially low. Um, and I think we have to do something to, to literally level the playing field so that um, uh, high spenders know there is a result to their action. And if they do go out and spend this kind of money, whether candidate or whether independent entity, there will be a response um, and they won't be able to, to keep a candidate from responding. Um, so I'm hopeful that that is uh, taken under consideration as well by the sponsor uh, as this bill moves and I hope it does move. Uh, I will now proceed to uh, the, the moment of the day, uh, transparency. We're very transparent. We like to be transparent. Uh, I know the CFB prides itself on transparency. Um, one of the things that Cher testified to is that if only the camp, the, the council would ask us, would ask you to come in a little earlier and talk about your budget, you would. No problem. 
I, I find that not, I won't say hard to believe because of course I trust you, Mr. Chair, but what I find uh, incredible is the notion that we're gonna create a system where we just ask each other to do stuff. Maybe just ask me to file disclosures every couple of weeks. Don't, don't put it in a law. And if you ask me, I'll do it, maybe. Um, or maybe just ask me to, you know, only spend campaign money on the things that are proper. You know, don't put it in a law because if you ask me, I'll do it. The reason we have laws is because we don't rely on asking. We rely on setting forth in, in the laws of New York what it is that we anticipate from agencies. And today, as I sit here and as you sit here, the only agency that I know of um, that isn't an elected legislature, because the council can't do this, is you uh, that can submit your budget to the mayor and have it in inserted into the, into the uh, executive budget untouched. Uh, we can do that, but, you know, and as somebody who's voted against the council budget uh, for the last four years and the only one who's done so, uh, because sometimes I think that, you know, agencies do spend more than they should, including this city's legislature. But we were elected. We were elected. And you weren't. And so asking an agency to submit its budget and come before the mayor and the city council, the, the 52 people in New York City who were elected to manage the city's budget, I don't think is really a high ask. Um, the, you know, the chair testified that this may be perceived um, as some kind of, you know, perceived as the quote, uh, I will um, uh, uh, modify that and say, I, I think you perceive that as kind of like a foot on the neck of the CFB almost like, you know, some kind of interference by the political uh, bodies of the city into the CFB's independence. And I, I think that the perception is, is yours and yours alone. Um, I, I don't believe that that perception is, is something that you know, the average person on the street of on the streets of the city thinks that somehow the council is interfering in your spending. There is no history in this council of having done so. Not in this session, not in the last session. I can't remember in the session before that there was. And the only example you can point to is that Rudy Giuliani uh, didn't like you folks. Uh, and I see uh, Ms. Gordon is here and, you know, I'm sure she has great stories and hopefully one day writes a book about it. Um, but that's not now. That's not now. And we don't we don't govern this city based on what Rudy Giuliani did in 1998. I don't think. Um, I'll also just respond very briefly that uh, we're not a Republican Trump controlled legislature and we're not Wisconsin. And I think that the idea that the comparisons that you were able to point to are those are uh, uh, unfair, to say the very least. You can respond if you want to, but uh, I'm just going to ask a question if you don't mind. Um, we talk about transparency, and when a private entity lobbies the city council or the mayor, they're required to register with the city clerk, they're required to disclose the target of their lobbying. They're required to let the people know who's lobbying and who's being lobbied and why. And I think that's right, and I think that's reasonable, and I think that's good for government. The CFB lobbies and it, does, it gets done in secret. So my question is, since we're here in public and we all have microphones, can you please state for the record which members of the council you have lobbied on this bill? Well, I, I can't answer that question. I haven't lobbied anybody. Okay. Uh, uh, but uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure what the relevance here is, Council Member Yeager. This is, not, this is not a trial, Mr. Chair. It's, it, 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 we're not subject to relevance. Well, I know, I know, but, okay. but we're, we're here to discuss your bill. And, and in response to your comments, I, I'd like to just make a short statement. So the bill does two things. Um, and I, I think the discussion is mixing them up a little bit and I, I hope it would clarify it if we separate them out. One of the things your bill would do would be to relieve the mayor of his obligation to transmit the budget estimate of the CFB as is in his executive budget to the council. Once that is done, of course, the council has always had the power uh, to not follow that recommendation, to reduce the, uh, the amount being requested. And on occasion it has done so, most recently uh, in fiscal year 
2021. Um, that's the part to which I made the reference about a perception that it would impact the independence of the CFB. Because it's very important that, and here I think we agree about the value of transparency, it's very important that the CFB be able to state publicly and release its estimate. And if it's part of the normal executive budget function where the mayor gets to decide what he puts in the executive budget, that process, and I, there's no criticism intended, it's just the way the process works, that process is not transparent. And so the, the, the folks who, who proposed the Charter Amendment of 1998 saw it important that the CFB estimate go as, it's not a demand, it's a request, go as is, it's an estimate to the city council. City council still has the power to reduce it, we appear for the hearings, we participate in that process. And so that's the part that I was referring to and which we most strenuously uh, oppose. On the other hand, your bill also addresses what you're uh, speaking of in terms of transparency. And that is the fact that you have not seen us participate in the preliminary budget process, at least in part perhaps because the charter requires us to submit our estimates to the mayor on March 10th and the preliminary budget process begins at an earlier date and you would have us submit us submit uh, the, the estimate in February instead. As a matter of history, for the first 20 years or so of our existence, we did participate in the uh, uh, preliminary budget process. And then starting at about 2011, the city council stopped asking us and so we weren't there because we weren't asked. If, if we're asked, we appear, we're happy to participate in the budget process. And if the council would like preliminary estimates before, I mean, the, the charter says March 10th is the date we have to submit it to the mayor. The council wants earlier estimates. We can provide them. We have no uh, uh, objection to that. Um, and so, so for that reason, I, you know, you say it, it requires legislation. It doesn't require legislation. We're, we're, we're an independent nonpartisan uh, uh, agency, but we respond to the city council. If the city council wants estimates at an earlier date, we're happy to participate. We did in the past, uh, we're happy to do in the future. That, that's the issue of transparency about which I don't think we actually disagree. Uh, so I, I just wanted to clarify those two separate pieces. I appreciate that, Mr. Chair. And, and so what, what I would say to that is, is first of all, the, the, the uh, proposed uh, bill uh, not just requires uh, February versus March, and I think February is a, is a fairer and more reasonable date, but it also has the board sending its uh, estimates to the mayor and the council, the words and council uh, being inserted into this bill. Uh, it's not currently in the statute. So the concern that that you know we that you would be sending your your estimate over to the mayor and then he would you know take out his his eye shades and you know his his, his accountant pen and start uh, playing with your budget and then sending it over to us we will have seen what it is you're asking for and and it, there would be a robust discussion during the preliminary budget process over a what does the CFB ask for b what does the mayor think you need and see what is the you know the conclusion the concluding a uh, conversation. What does the council believe? But it's part of the process, and and that is the process for every agency. Um, what if, I would if, also if I if I might, Councilmember, let me just respond to that point because I, I hear you, but I think you're missing an important point here, and that is that we we are not a mayoral agency. Okay, we were not set up to be a major mayoral agency. We are a nonpartisan independent agency for good reason, given our function. And the point that of our submitting something to the mayor that he must include in the executive budget that he sends over to the council is so that we, unlike mayoral agencies, are not engaged in the normal negotiation process with the mayor's staff and OMB about our budget. Why? Because the mayor is one of the people that we all have oversight over uh, to the extent that he's running or has run or will again run uh, for re-election. And so the whole point in protecting our independence is to uh, 
isolate us from that process, that negotiation process that other mayoral agencies quite appropriately have to participate in because they are mayoral agencies. But we are an oversight agency that has oversight over the mayor as well. And so I, I find it a little bit um, striking that you as a council member are proposing a bill that doesn't actually increase the council members or the, the council's oversight over us, but actually gives the mayor more power. I, I don't really, I'm not sure you've thought about it in those terms, but, but that's the way it strikes, it strikes me. And, and, and it's because we are not a mayoral agency, because we are an independent and nonpartisan agency that we are exempted from that process. And that has served us and the city and the people of New York well uh, for the last 40 years. I appreciate I, that. I'll just I'll just add one yes, factual just come. We uh, you know every year that we submit our budget to the mayor, the, uh, it is also submitted to the council at the exact same time. So currently that process um, already exists. So we do submit it to both at the same time. Okay, I, I appreciate that. What I would also point out um, along those lines is that there are plenty of agencies that are are independent. Uh, and that are also oversight agencies that, that do participate in our processes, um, uh, whether it's the Conflicts of Interest Board, the Department of Investigations, the five district attorneys, um, uh, they, they send over what they want and we have conversations about it. And yes, it's true uh, that, that in this particular uh, version of the bill, uh, the, the mayor is gaining more authority than the mayor currently has under the charter but the mayor's not gaining more authority than the mayor currently has under the charter over any other agency. So in other words, it simply equitizes and, and uh, consistentizes the treatment of the campaign finance board for the budget process uh, as, other, as every other agency. Now I know that we're not gonna agree because um, your view of, of the CFB is that it ought not be uh, treated as every other agency with regard to the budget process. And that's something that we'll be in disagreement about, but. The idea that we're giving the mayor under this bill greater authority is only limited to that he's having greater authority than he currently would have, not greater authority than he has under any other agency. Um, and at the same time, it's an opportunity for uh, your request to be viewed holistically along the entire uh, uh, financial struggles that a mayor has to do when the mayor is deciding whether or not we have to you know, we can afford to pick up the trash twice a week or only once a week, or whether we can get, uh, you know, another firehouse funded or whether the libraries need more money. Yes, the campaign finance board is important, but it ought to be part of the bigger package of what is it we are deciding to do in the city. And I would also point out, since I, I brought this part up, that this does not affect campaign finance spending, not one bit that's not touched. Um, uh, the campaign finance board still maintains its authority to simply requisition from OMB the needed amounts uh, for the for the election fund um, uh, without without worry whatsoever. It's always adjusted later in the budget. You need more, you get more, you need less. We fix that later. Uh, and that's never been in contention whatsoever. So this is really just for the operations of of the CFB. Yes, and, let's, yeah. let's let's be clear that what those operations consist of, they consist of uh, a, a nonpartisan voter engagement and outreach. They consist of uh, assistance to candidates during uh, and analyses and monitoring during the election cycle. And they include the audit process and oversight after the elections are over. All of those things are highly, um, uh, how shall we say, touchy issues because of their political implications and therefore the charter made the CFB indep more independent than other agencies because it has those functions. And the danger of those functions becoming politicized is so great that that is why the budgetary uh, independence of the CFB exists. I appreciate that. And Mr. Chair, what I would point out uh, with regard to those items, for example, uh, and, and all the others you haven't listed is that if it, it, at every hearing of of this committee and this council, uh, including this morning, uh, as long as I've been here and for years and years before, what you've heard from members is uh, a desire for increase on all of the items you just listed, the, the voter outreach, uh, the, the engagement, uh, the audit process uh, uh, has, uh, has been desirous by members to be more 
uh, to, to be greater funded so that it conclude quicker, for example. Um, I don't think you've ever seen a council, uh, certainly not the four years that I've been here, say that the CFB uh, shouldn't spend more on doing these things. So if anything, bringing you to the table earlier, um, if a mayor, uh, and this is, you know, obviously we're at a stage in time where we know that one mayor is leaving and we know who the next mayor is and we know he's going to be there for the next uh, four and possibly eight years. We know who the players at the table are. Um, and I don't think you've seen any indication whatsoever that this council is looking to reduce the impact of uh, of the ability of the CFB to do the things that that you just listed. Um, the and in fact, I would say that that there has been, if anything, let's just uh, use the colloquial fetching um, amongst council members that perhaps you don't get enough to do the to do the voter outreach. For example, there's been talk about uh, the the mail voter guide. Um, for example, not being sufficient, uh, we, you know, uh, Director Lopress uh, was here um, uh, uh, several times over the last year talking about uh, the work of the CFB to educate about uh, the new method of voting. And I think that universally, I see uh, my friend Councilman Miller's here, we've talked uh, significantly here in this committee and in this council about the fact that the CFB does not have enough money uh, to spend on, on teaching people how to vote under this new method of voting. And I think the numbers play out that there are a good number of voters who actually didn't uh, exercise their full five choices. Um, and whether they did that deliberately or whether they did that because they just don't know how to vote under the new system, we don't know. Um, and there's no poll afterwards to figure it out. But what we've done is talk about how you need more resources, not less. I think the idea, uh, I, I see you nodding, so I don't, I don't, I never want to cut right, you off. We're in complete agreement on that. Okay. The issue is not this council or this mayor or the next mayor. The issue is sort of the long-term independence of the agency. We appreciate the support that we have gotten in the past uh, from from this council and recent councils, uh, as well as you know this mayor and recent mayors. But that's not the issue. We're looking, you know, for uh, uh, we're looking at a charter provision that was drafted to serve us well, both in good times and in bad times. Well, I, I could do this all day, but I won't because, uh, because the chair has been overly kind to me and I see Councilman Miller uh, is, is patiently waiting. Um, but what I, I would say is that uh, in my closing, let's roll the dice and give it a try, Chair. Let's see how it works out. And, and let's trust, I trust, uh, that the next session of the council, uh, the next mayor, the incoming mayor, um, uh, we'll do, we'll do what is necessary for the CFB to be able to do its good work. Uh, and I, I don't foresee the problem that, you know, and I recognize your, uh, uh, being conservative, uh, in, in your, in your desire to hold back, uh, uh, any change to the way things are, but I say, I think we're going to be okay. And I say, we give it a shot to, to make the budget process a little more transparent, um, and to uh, and and to have that holistic conversation about the finances. Um, before I before I just go back to the chair, and I appreciate the chair very much for giving me this time. Uh, I will go back to the topic. Or, you know, I, I don't forget things, chair. And so uh, the top of my questioning uh, was with regard to lobbying. Um, and so I guess it's not directed to the lay leadership of the board uh, so much as the staff of the board. But I think it's important for the board. If you don't want to say, just say you don't want to say. Um, but I think that if the board can say for the record which council members have been lobbied on this bill, uh, that would be very helpful for us. The one thing, the one thing I'll say is that I mean I know there's there there are a number of, of, of organizations that, to my understanding, are are interested in this topic, and and there may have been conversations with members. Um, I, we have nothing to to report in terms of. of Lobbying per se. I mean, you know, it's a, as a matter of course. Agencies of all sorts have 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 conversations with with members of the body, um, but I'll, I'll just leave it at that. Um, let me be more specific. Then, has the campaign finance board lobbied members? Uh, out has the campaign finance board done outreach to members of this council in the last three weeks about this bill? Sorry, could you could you say that one more time? Has the campaign finance board? done outreach in any way to members of this council over the last three weeks about this bill? We talk to members about, about, about bills whenever they come up uh, in terms of in terms of adhering at, at, at all the bills uh, that we're talking about today, bills that have come up in previous hearings. Um, it's, it's just a matter of, of kind of due diligence to, to talk to folks and, and see what 
what their concerns are, what uh, what what their policy goals are, and 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 offer whatever help or assistance we can. That's that's so that's, that's the work that we do. Out of respect for for uh, uh, for our relationship and and uh, this committee and your work, I'm I'm going to leave it at that, and I'm not going to go back to the question of asking you to name members, but. Uh, I would say that that going back to where I started, uh, the CFB lobbies the council on its bills. It, it, you can call it any word you want, but it's lobbying, and lobbying ought to be disclosed. Uh, and and when you talk about when you combine the topic of, you know, that you're an independent agency and not answerable to this, that, and the other thing, can't have it both ways. If you if you want to be a mayoral agency and and you know talk about how you can talk to the council all the time about bills, no problem. But if you want to be an independent entity and and then you lobby the council, I think that ought to be disclosed. And maybe not in the formal way that that a private sector a developer would need to disclose its lobbying. But there ought to be some disclosure about the independent entity dis, uh, lobbying this council. And uh, I'll leave it at that, Mr. Chair. I'm very grateful for the time. Uh, uh, Chair Schaefer, it's really good to see you. Uh, and Director Lopress, Director Friedman, it's good to see you both. And uh, I yield back to the chair. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Next, we'll hear from Council Member Miller. Good afternoon, and thank you uh, again, Mr. Chair. Oh, it's, uh, it's almost afternoon there. Uh, and let me just say for the record, I, I have never been lobbied, nor contacted, nor had a conversation with any member of, of CFB ever. Um, so uh, this is, it, it seems to be that there's been a lot of uh, question in terms of 1901 that that relates directly to uh, the independence of of CFB and their ability to uh, deliver services on behalf of the city of New York and campaign finances. Um, uh, obviously, the 1901 uh, uh, speaks to that as well, and and that is the disclosure of those that that are involved. Uh, and independent expenditures, um, and, and we talked about individuals. Um, my questions are in relation to uh, not just the independent uh, individual uh, candidates, but the uh, the uh, ballot initiatives as well, and, and whether or not uh, and, and uh, the, the individuals and organizations that had been involved in investing in these uh, ballot initiatives had been required to disclose information in the same way. Uh, I would refer back to campaign financing. I would refer back to the Otto and Murdoch family and others that poured in millions of dollars in the last few weeks of the campaign, uh, whether or not that information was disclosed by campaign finance. I know that we were able to... Uh, to find that information through the State Board of Elections, um, but not sure as of yet, I have yet to see uh, campaign finance um, reveal that information. So uh, as, as, as part of the reforms, we wanna make sure that uh, all of this information gets out uh, as well. And, and so uh, question is, is, is what is, you know, what would that mechanism be? Is, is there cross-reference uh, between uh, CFB and, and, and Board of Elections and or are you just um, aggregating that information independently on your own and, and, and then w where can we find it? So, uh, so Council Member Miller, we are very supportive of expanding the uh, requirement that uh, there, the disclosure of contributors be expanded from independent spenders who spend on candidates to end independent spenders who spend on city ballot proposals. As you point out, uh, that, that contributor information is already disclosed at the state level. Um, we have our own independent expenditure disclosure portal that, uh, and, and both for uh, the spenders to disclose that information and for that information to be presented to the public. So we are very supportive of expanding that disclosure to the contributors, to people who spend on it, ballot proposals. So is there currently something that forbids that from happening? Is it, does, does this or other legislation have to happen or has the um, has CFB just 
been uh, negligent in reporting that information thus far? The contributor information is, for, uh, is not required to be reported. The spending information is required to be reported and we have disclosed that. Again, this is about city ballot proposals. Correct. And so for 2019 and 2018, you will find the spending on those ballot proposals uh, disclosed on our website. Uh, what is missing and what is not required is the, con the contributor information for those spenders. So we, this bill would make it parallel to uh, people who spend so on- Amazon. Because it's re not required, does that mean that you cannot do it? Well, because we don't, the, we have to, it has to be required that the spenders report it to us. So we, we, they, we don't have the information because it's not required for them to report it to us. You, you have the expenditure, the amount, but you don't have their- You don't have the contributors. But you do know who they are. Well, I mean, they're in on um, they're using they're the same the mechanism state. that we use the cross utilization of BOE. We we do know who they are. Okay, yeah. so um, it, it, it's is 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 there any way that that there could be that this coordination and, and does that require this nineteen oh one to make that happen? So we'll, we'll establish that. So, so if, and, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. No, I, I think what, what, what the bill will do is, is we'll expand the requirements so that, that entities that spend to support or oppose ballot measures in the city give us that information. So we publish information as we, re, as we receive it from the spenders. Um, that's what we're set up to do. Um, you know, the, again, as, as, you, as you noted, the information is available with other agencies. Right. And, and, so, and, and so, we, so we don't, as a matter of course, aren't taking data from other places. And, and, right. Yeah, and, yeah. yeah. But, but, but there was a lot of time spent this morning talking about the integrity and independence of, of CFB. Do you don't think that that was necessary information to maintain the integrity of uh, and independence that, that you don't think that that's something that taxpayers have a right to know about? Um, we talked about, you know, maintaining independence and, and, and how important that was. While I do agree with, with, with my colleague that, that everything should be on the table, particularly in moments of crisis, how we uh, fiscally um, adhere to uh, the responsibilities of the council as to whether or not how streets get swept, how, you know, public services get delivered, um, while, you know, uh, one might argue um, that there are distinct differences. This, this certainly remains a, a, a public service, whether or not it's implementation of the democracy uh, or not. So in, in, in terms of that, there, there's been a lot of conversation about that. Do we not deem it important enough to have these type of checks and balances independent, or were you waiting for the council to mandate for that to happen? You talk to council members, as you said, pretty regularly, uh, then, then why not suggest that this would help in maintaining the integrity of the body if we could provide this information, if not for the lack of legislative uh, uh, authorization? It's, it's definitely something that we can look into. And so again, I mean- Why haven't you looked into it as of yet? It's because, because the chair because pointed out time, wait a minute, the chair yeah. pointed out time and time again that since 1998 charter, well, 1998, this is like everything else, these living documents that, that have unintended consequences and, and, and changes and and do you review it or, or are we going to remain steadfast on what was believed to be the best document to put forth in 1998 right and and whether or not obviously you know uh uh citizen united and and, and all these other dynamics have really changed the rules of engagement since but yet um we're still going according to the 98 charter very specifically. So, you know, if, if I would hope that in your advocacy, in your responsibility, including uh, your, your responsibility as a board, as a body, as an agency, that, that you review these situations and, and uh, use this partnership to talk to the members of the council 
uh, and others to 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 address these issues that obviously need to be addressed um, and not sit back and wait for us to get into this hearing and, and to say, yeah, well, you know what, that's a good point, because if we don't have this, it'll be another five years and 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 we won't have this information. Um, so. Uh, along that line, and, and, and talk about mechanism. There, there's been good good government good government groups uh, in our city, which which work very closely um, with the the uh, CFB and, and and other entities um, around implementation rollout of some of these policies, particularly ranked choice voting. Speaking very specifically about about uh, citizens union and. And, and common cause, uh, and, and and very specifically, and and uh, and, and RSV, RSCV, RCV, um, to which there was significant city dollars uh, funneled into implementation, in which these same groups uh, were paid uh, to disseminate information. At the same time. The latter has even retained the lobbyists uh, to address and support implementation of RCV. Uh, the question is, uh, are there any restrictions on this independent uh, expenditure? Should there be? Should there be restrictions on who the players are in the game if, in fact, the players are so intimately involved in a particular ballot uh, initiative, and I'm speaking specifically to the integrity of CFB, because that seems to be the issue here. That at any point is that a conversation in your board meetings that perhaps we should pull back, or perhaps we should not fund a particular group or individual because they're too close, and that closeness might undermine the integrity of this body. Is that a conversation? <laughs> Uh, I'm sorry, I want to make sure that I, I kind of speak to, to, to the, the conversation about the bill and, and, and I want to and also try to understand, um, you know, the point here. I, I do want to make sure that I say clearly we are, our testimony is that we are supportive of intro 1901. It, it, it fixes what we see as, as, as a gap in disclosure requirements uh, for spenders uh, on ballot measures and uh, having it in the, in the bill, in, in, in law, will allow us to compel spenders to provide us with disclosure, which we can then make available to the public. And that, um, we, that, that our testimony is that we're supportive of the bill for those reasons. Um, you know, in terms of, um, and I wanna I, I think your, your question is about the, the efforts that um, a lot of groups engaged in uh, on, on, on sort of educating voters about ranked choice voting, which, which we did a lot of, which I know that there are other groups that, that did a lot of, we, we certainly, we're, we're coordinating as, as well as we could to ensure everybody got the same message. Um, I, I, I wasn't sure that I followed your question in terms of, of funding, but because we, we didn't, um, but, but so, I mean, that's, so, that's what so I can the say. Question that. Is, the, the question is, um, where's the separation between those who participate in the actual advocacy and the actual implementation? Is, 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 is there a line that we remain uh, political independence because the line is blurred? Well, the charter, you know, the 2019 charter that added ranked choice voting gave the campaign finance board the responsibility to engage in an education campaign. Um, we obviously didn't, you know, as a city agency didn't, we're not involved at all, except for in printing the voter guide as we're required for that charter referendum in advocating, you know, one way or the other about the charter referendum. When the referendum was passed and we were given that mandate, we coordinated with other organizations that were providing education in order, as, as Mr. Freeman pointed out, to make sure that the voters didn't get any kind of uh, mixed messages that the, the information was clear and concise and the same uh, provided you know, across a uh, variety of uh, organizations that were educating voters about ranked choice voting. So it's these the are the same, out. right, then these are the same folks who were in favor of the ballot initiative that was then responsible for putting information out, pro, uh, 
prior to and 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 after the passage as well, right? So I, I just just again in in, in a table, and I don't want to be the dead horse on that, but I, I do want to just 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 stay on the integrity of, of this and and the expenditure. I don't think that you know having the autonomy to just to spend our way out of inequity is is the answer, right? Because I would submit that there are things that happen in particularly communities of color, African American community that have created. Uh, uh, um, the the political uh, uh, strongholds and advocacy that we see throughout, and that is quite frankly sweat equity. People knocking on doors and doing other things that that you you just can't buy your way out of, right? And 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 and, and oftentimes that seems to be dismissed in in these conversations. But but um, but that being said, you know if, if we talk about equity. Does CFB currently have the type of autonomy that says that um, you have a credible Democratic or Republican general um, election, but you don't, and therefore you're not going to receive additional campaign finance dollars for the general election? Is that the case? And if so, how, how does that determine? Um. If you're talking about the public funding for individual candidates, then yes, there are provisions in the law to protect when uh, a candidate is uh, um, uh, facing, you know, certain kinds of, uh, th there's a limit on the amount of public funds you can get and candidates need to file what is called in the law, a statement of need demonstrating, you know, a number of different factors that they have a significant opponent. Uh, so they're, or otherwise they are limited to getting 25% of the maximum rather than the full 100% of the maximum. So that is already in the law that a candidate would have to demonstrate. And, and, and what is the oversight on those dollars? Well, this is we, the same oversight, you know, that we conduct when we produce, when we provide public funds. So one might, one in some case may get 25, 50% or nothing where someone else gets 75% or whatever the, the, the number is. But also, here's my concern. My, my concern is, is, is that I'm, I'm, I'm seeing handbags and sweatshirts and T-shirts for, for elections. I can't even purchase a, a staff T-shirt uh, for events for, for, for my staff with OTPS money. And, and these are the same tax dollars that we're talking about, and people are able to do these things, right? So if there is a responsibility around integrity, that same fiscal responsibility has to be undertaken by CFB as well, right? Is, is that the case? And I mean, again, of course, we do audit the campaigns to make sure that money that's, the public money is spent on campaign matters. We don't you know, because campaigns are run in a variety of different ways, we don't dictate how the candidates, you know, spend their money. We just uh, make ensure that the public funds are spent on campaign related uh, expenditures. Um, and the law does include certain expenditures that the types of things that candidates cannot spend public money on it is more of an exclusionary list rather than an inclusionary list. So do, do, is this, again, when you have your board meetings, are, are these conversations that come up on, on, on the best use of public funds on how, because, you know, I, I know that, that there are many more ideas out there about increasing uh, uh, campaign finance contributions about creating a, a stipend and and you know things of that nature there at, at, at what point does the fiduciary responsibility of the board to kick in and kind of say eh, maybe we should push back maybe that this is not the intent of the charter is this a conversation that that is had or are we just going to spend I mean, our way through these are, I mean, obviously these are conversations, you know, there's been recommendations in post-election reports over the years. And I, again, you know, I welcome, you know, having discussions with you uh, and your staff and, you know, staff of the council 
to discuss, you know, what you know what the, what council members think is our appropriate uses of the public funds. Again, you know, we we apply the law, and you you are correct, you know, that there is, um, you know, there are probably are some you know examples of things that are pushing the envelope, and there certainly have been enforcement actions that uh, you know have cited candidates for. Uh, spending money on not campaign related expenditures. And I welcome discussing, you know, how, how we could uh, craft uh, I the that. rules I, or law director, to make it clearer and I, uh, better. I, I appreciate that, but I would say that I, uh, that I am 30 days left of my <laughs> year term. <laughs> yeah. And, and I, I hope that, you know, as was uh, articulated earlier, that there's many conversations that happen between CFB and the board, I hope that that's just not occurring between friends of CFB and the board, because I have not been privy to a single one of those conversations. And I, I, I would submit that public policy happens by virtue of public discourse. And we're not talking about it. We're not fixing it. Every time I go to City Hall, I bring that discourse and those conversations of my community, of, of, of the residents of City of New York, come with me, right? And I would hope that that same responsibility happens in CFB and, and, and other agencies when they do that. I want to thank you so very much for, for your time and your indulgence. Um, I want to thank uh, the chair for his time and his indulgence and his partnership over the years as well. So thank you, everyone. And, and uh, uh, happy holidays, uh, happy Hanukkah uh, and, and, uh, and, and Christmas and Kwanzaa to, to, to everyone there. Thank you. You too. Thank you, Council Member. I'll now turn it back to Chair Cabrera for any further questions. Thank you so much, uh, Council Member Miller. Thank you uh, for your input. And again, thank you uh, for being who you are. You've always been consistently uh, straightforward and uh, fighting uh, uh, for the issues in our community. Uh, well, I finally get to ask my questions. And so uh, I know we got two more panels. So if you could give me the short version of the answer, uh, we, you know, being parsimonious here with our time, I, I really appreciate it. Uh, so let me start with, and, I, and I'm gonna be reading those so that way I can be quicker. Uh, how did the independent spending in 2021 compare to past election cycles? And with that, uh, are there any notable trends that CFB has identified? And what do these trends tell us about what to expect in future elections? So, you know, there has been uh, an increase. Um, there was about uh, 30, 30, $31.8 million in outside spending in the mayoral's race. And that is, you know, definitely more than it was in 2017 and 2013. Um, again, you know, there is the, there is a trend in increase in uh, independent spending. Again, also though we have always, the increase in public funds that are available to candidates have really helped candidates, you know, uh, com uh, uh, support, com support, give out, get out their message and combat those independent spending. But again, we are supportive of the uh, uh, concepts in the bill before the council today. And what do you expect uh, in the future, uh, in future election? I mean, I think the trend in you know elections across the country are that there is an increase in its independent spending. I think that that will probably be the trend here in New York also. Uh, what are some of the biggest challenges to achieving a transparency with, with respect to independent expenditures? I think that you know this transparency issue, which we, you know, it was one of the topics in our post-election report after the last election um, is again, you know, making sure that we have a full in disclosure of independent spenders across all uh, types of spending for candidates and also for the ballot measures. And this contributor disclosure would close a gap. Also the paid for notice would close a gap in that disclosure. Um, we have the count with the council, we have worked really hard in improving our uh, independent disclosure over the years since it was first enacted. And I think we have one of the best uh, independent expenditure disclosures, you know, as far as uh, with this one gap uh, in the country. 
Thank you. And in, in, uh, in the 2021 mayoral primary, there was not, let me say that again, there was not a strong correlation between the amount of outside money spent on a candidate and the number of votes the candidate ultimately received. How, how typical is this compared to all the elections in 2021? Uh, what about elections in past years? And what do you think accounts for the lack of correlation? I think that, I mean, you know, this is not an unheard of in the 2013 election. You know, there was also a lot of independent spending and there wasn't necessarily a strong correlation between the success of the candidates and the amount of independent spending on their behalf. Um, I think that the reason for that is because of our strong public financing program and the availability of public matching dollars, the candidates have the ability to get their message out regardless of the spending by independent actors. Uh, will CFB need additional resources in order to implement either of the two independent expenditure bills we are hearing here today? Um, I don't anticipate that there would be increased spending for those that those two bills. Okay, that's good to know. I know Councilmember Yeager would be happy to hear that. <laughs> uh, how does CFB status as an independent agency affect how the board approaches its work? I, I don't know if the chair is still here. If you wanted to take answer yeah, the see, question. Yeah. So Chair, you want me to repeat the question? Yes, please. <laughs> sure. How does CFB status as an independent agency affect how the board approaches its work? Well, it, it, it informs everything that we do. Uh, uh, the, um, the agency has a long tradition of being uh, nonpartisan and independent. Um, we are uh, appointed by uh, either the mayor or the speaker of the city council. Uh, they, there are required to be some mix of party affiliations uh, among the members of the board. Um, but um, unlike some of what we read about, about agencies elsewhere or, or agencies at the state level, uh, this agency has really truly been uh, nonpartisan from its very inception. Uh, and when we meet to discuss particular issues, whether they're large policy issues uh, or specific issues relating to proposed fines against individual candidates, the way in which our views break out are completely um, random in the sense that they do not line up with who appointed who or what party affiliation uh, particular members have. Uh, everybody operates in a collegial way, but on the basis of their view of the merits. Uh, and it, it informs absolutely everything we do. Our staff, of course, is an entirely professional staff. They conduct their audits and their legal analyses and their recommendations with a view to what would be in the best interests of the system and the citizens and voters of the city of New York. And uh, that, that's really who we are, that's in our DNA. Thank you, Mr. Chair. On the current law, the mayor has the power to include recommendations in the executive budget, as we heard today, regarding the appropriations for CFB. How often does the mayor exercise this power? Uh, and please let me know as far as back as you can remember. I'm going to defer to just someone else because I've only been there four years. So uh, Amy or Eric, you better answer that question. I'll say that he, they, it is not exercised that often, but it has been in the past. And I think it uh, depends on the mayor. So, um, you know, I think it, uh, I would have to do some research to see exactly when the last time it was. Um, I, you know, in the past recent memory, uh, there has been no commentary uh, uh, added appended to our budget, uh, but uh, I, so I would have to do some research to find out when the last time that happened was. So it didn't happen in this administration. Is that what I hear yeah, saying? Yeah, yes, I think they, I think it's safe to say that it did not happen in this administration. In the in the okay. years that Mayor De Blasio has been mayor. And the one before that, Bloomberg, do you recall? 
then I actually can't recall. I would have to go, you know, make make certain before I gave you the answer to that. Okay, thank you so much. I'm pretty much done with my question. I know we got two more panels and uh, we're eager to get to them. Uh, but if the moderator don't have, if we don't see anybody else, we oh, actually we do see another question. I see Council Member Miller with his hand up. So let me pass it back to uh, my colleagues. I, I, thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and forgive me. There was one question that, that I neglected to ask, and that was, um, have you disaggregated the information on this past council race or uh, other council races on the course of a uh, individual uh, broken down by individual districts and or the average course of, of the race? Um, so on, on our website, there is the individual amount of public funds given to each candidate, and you can sort that by council district. Um, again, uh, we can, you know, we are in the process of producing our post-election report, and that information is certainly in that post-election report. Um, but again, if you would like to see that, you know, any of that data, we can send it over to you in, you know, in a, in a written form so that you can review it. So right now you do know how much was spent on each individual race? In, in public funds. Yes. With public funds. Yes. And 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 that could be disaggregated by 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 city council district, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, but 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 do we know how much each vote is costing? Based um, on well, that? you know, we know how many votes there are. Um I guess I think I can't actually is, is that possible? whether they're whether is, they're is it possible to know that we spent the election. Yeah, sorry to talk about you. So, so as, as you know, the, you can you can find all the vote totals uh, at the Board of Elections website, vote.nyc. Um, yeah, all of the information you guys the public funds, the that we, funds that we have out is, we, yes, and, and the information about public funds, you can see at, at our website, at www.nyccfb.info. Um, all that information is there. And Very specifically, I can find out how much money was spent in the 27 district per candidate? Absolutely. Uh, in terms and of public funds, well, do public I have to funds to paid to candidates, yes. yes. And, and, well, or do I have to figure out myself how much it, it, it amounts to, right? Someone got $300,000 and they got 300 votes. Yeah, so we I, have to do that. We have to do the, we do I the have math. To do the math or can you do the math? <laughs> well, we are happy to do the math for you and send it. Yeah, we would appreciate if you do the math, right? Because it, honestly, I think that that um, the public would, would, would like to know that, that whether or not this is the best use of public funds and whether or not it needs to be adjusted and, and or whatever happened. I think that is the type of information that allow us to make um, informed decisions, the type of discourse that, 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 that won't just be members in the room that really have public in the room asking these questions as well. Thank you so very much. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Council Member. And just uh, for the record, when would the post-election uh, report will be coming out? Um, the charter requires it to be issued in September of the year after the election. Um, we have to wait for the final disclosure statement in January, uh, the post-election disclosure statement, and to do the analysis of, you know, the complete analysis of the election. Okay, thank you so much. I don't see anybody else uh, with a hand. Oh, wait a second, Councilmember Yeager. I see Councilmember Yeager. He has a question. Thank, thank you. Real quick, um, uh, Madam Director. In light of the chair's remarks earlier, and several times that uh, all we have to do is ask, uh, I'd like to ask the following: um, Since this is a short term of the council, the, the one that starts in January is a two-year term of the council, and the charter really does only require your post-election report by September. Um, uh, by the time that that happens, the term of this council will uh, be almost half done. Uh, I, to the extent possible, if there's any way you can hustle uh, without a law that requires you to do so, um, it would be very helpful. Councilman Miller raised a very good point about the dollar spent per vote uh, in some of the districts. And I think what we saw in the special election, particularly uh, after the eight to one went into effect, uh, were, were candidates receiving uh, just really ridiculously high amounts um, with, for, for uh, what can only be described as non-viable campaigns. Um, and I think that as the next council comes in in January and starts to really analyze how this eight to one worked together with the early payments, together with 
um, the, the access to the ballot being reduced, uh, it's, it's a robust conversation that must happen. And the earlier we do it, and I see Director Friedman nodding his head and nodding his head uh, to me, I, I will uh, accept that as, uh, as an agreement. Uh, uh, well, so before, before, thank you, Councilman Yeager, before you speak for, for, uh, for me, I would just add, I, I agree that um, as, you, as you, uh, you noted with the urgency, and, and as you've noted, there is a lot for us to look at uh, coming off of this um, historic election with all of the changes to the Campaign Finance Act you mentioned with um, really uh, you know, record number of candidates participating, record number of payments going out the door. Uh, there is a lot for us to look at um, and, and a lot of analysis for us to conduct. So um, I, I appreciate certainly the urgency as you stated it. I hope you appreciate the work we have ahead of us. And so you know, we're gonna, we're gonna get those um, get the report together, and hopefully it'll it'll be in time for uh, the next council to pick it up and and and, and take action if if so needed. Thank you very much. Well, also, I I just like to add that uh, I think you've certainly identified one of the issues uh, that we are going to need to look at in in formulating our post uh, election recommendations, uh, and we we certainly will consider it. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you so much. Uh, every time you said. Uh, chair, I always get confused if you're talking about Chair <laughs> Schaefer or myself, or you're putting words <laughs> in my mouth. I, 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 we're going to have to put uh, captions uh, in, the, in the video here to, re, to to making sure that. Anyway, uh, I want to I want to thank you uh, all for the work that you do. It's not easy. I, I have to tell you uh, that uh, there's always a mistrust. You know when this when this races, I uh, you know I've gone through those myself, right? Uh, there's not a candidate that's always questioning. I you know are they doing me right? I think the fundamental question that people want to know is is if do we have a fair process? That's all people want. Uh, you know at the end of the day, candidates and constituents. And so whatever we could do, I know there's council members coming back. Uh, they will carry uh, the torch and the rest of us will continue to be a voice in whatever place we end up next chapter in life. But we wanted, I just want to thank you all again for the wonderful work that you do. It's not easy. I know you feel the pressure, uh, but it matters. And so, so with that, uh, we'll move on to the next uh, uh, panel. And again, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Cabrera. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now hear from the Mayor's Office of Operations. Our panelist is Acting Director Daniel Steinberg. Acting Director Steinberg, please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Thank you. You may begin your testimony. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Cabrera and members of the Government Operations Committee. Um, thank you and congratulations to Chair Cabrera for his leadership on this committee um, at this year last hearing. It's a privilege to be part of it. Um, my name is Dan Steinberg. I'm the acting director of the Mayor's Office of Operations, um, the office tasked with implementing local laws 126, 127, and 128, also known as the demographic data bills. At operations, we take great pride in spearheading multi-agency initiatives and driving toward the desired outcome, whether by directive from our executive leadership or by implementing local laws. These local laws are no exception. Um, they, they really speak directly to our mission of using data to help the city improve service delivery and, and make informed and equitable policy decisions. We, we share a commitment to using demographic data to better design programs, to better serve the public. Um, we, we believe that to empower agencies to best serve the, the city's varied populations, it's crucial to have deep, rigorous, and nuanced understandings of the populations we serve. The demographic data laws require ACS, DIFTA, DOE, Health Department, DHS, DSS, and DYCD to offer service seekers a voluntary and anonymous survey that collects demographic information regarding ancestry and languages spoken, um, multiracial, ancestry or ethnic origin, sexual orientation, gender identity, and gender pronouns. They also require operations to conduct an annual review for the City Council of all relevant agency and contract reforms from these agencies with demographic questions addressed in the survey that are eligible for updating. And agencies are required to update eligible form responses by April, 2020, April 22nd, 2022. And, um, and I'm here today to tell you that we're on track. 
Um, several years ago, implementation of these laws was admittedly bumpy. Uh, there were issues we needed to address and improve. We learned from that experience with new leadership and firmer guidance, and, and frankly, a far more aggressive approach on our part, um, coupled with the patience and, and helpful conversations with the lead sponsor, Council Member Drum, uh, we're on a path to full compliance. Um, not without additional challenges. Um, I do want to mention that the, the pandemic hit um, as this program was really picking up momentum and, and op staff were assigned the pandemic response, vaccination recovery roles for the last two years. But nevertheless, we protected and renewed our, our efforts on this program. And for that, uh, I'm very grateful to, to our staff. Um, they, they did an amazing job in general, keeping their eye on the ball while, while um, performing heroically during the pandemic. Um, I, I also wanna take a moment to thank a few people. First, Council Member Drum for his leadership on, on these important issues. Um, again, to recognize the Mayor's Office of Operations and the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs um, for your dedication and persistence in getting this right, again, while you were immersed in pandemic response work. Um, and I wanted to thank our agency partners, DYCD, ACS, the Health Department, DOE, DIFTA, and DSS, um, for their commitment to uh, seeing collection of, of important demographic data as culture change, um, not an operational burden. This is a key point because we really do need the full um, participation and, and buy-in uh, of the agencies. And, and we've come a long way in that front also. Um, so since releasing the Voluntary Anonymous Demographic Survey form in 2018, we've received over 132,000 return surveys. Um, that actually amounts to over 750,000 um, rows of data that, that's available uh, in, in the open data portal. Um, during the 2020 annual form review, our, our third such review, we, we identified 74 forms that qualified for review. Of these, 21 were deemed eligible for updating. 24 were not within the agency's authority to edit or amend. Um, or were issued by another entity, and 29 did not contain demographic data questions. And, and so this review was conducted in conjunction with the law department and, and our own general counsel. Um, of the 21 forms deemed eligible for updating, eight have already been updated this year, which is ahead of the mandated deadline. And again, we're on track with the others. So we're in the middle of our fourth annual form review now. Um, we're committed to building on this work, making the data more useful to both agencies and the general public. Um, we look forward to partnering with agencies around the strategic application of this new data to, to better meet the needs of the communities they serve. And our team and operations is proud to assist agencies in figuring out how to use data uh, to help serve New Yorkers more equitably. Um, so if I can may briefly address introduction number 1937, um, which expands the current demographic data laws to cover all city agencies uh, rather than just the social service agencies. Um, the bill makes a number of additional changes aimed at updating more agency forms with demographic data questions and getting agencies to encourage individuals filling out those forms to answer the questions to, to improve response rates, which is a shared goal of ours also. Um, we support the intent of the bill to further agency compliance with the existing demographic laws. We've been working closely with agencies to achieve this goal. We also support the goal of collecting more data that can uh, help our agencies serve all New Yorkers. We have concerns about the trade-offs that can come with increased data collection, which can range from simply making a form more difficult for individuals to complete to discouraging certain vulnerable populations from city services. We look forward to a productive dialogue with council members, how we can work with our agencies to achieve the goals of, uh, of this proposed legislation. Um, so that's my prepared testimony. I'm very, very happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. I don't see questions by my colleagues, and if they do, uh, uh, please let me know. But let me just jump into some questions. You might have mentioned it, but it, it, if you did, it escaped me. But thank you for, first of all, your candid uh, 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 report here. I wanted to know how many agencies currently correct the demographic information specified in Section 15 of the Charter and how many agencies will be required to collect this information on the introduction number 1937? Currently, it's, it's the agencies um, th that I listed. And, and um, right. I'm happy to do it again. I have it right here. But it, it, it's um, DSS, um, ACS, DIFTA, DOE, the Health Department, um, and DYCD. Um, as I understand it, the new legislation would broaden um, the, the work to all agencies, which, which obviously is a, is a very heavy lift, but, but um, well worth um, discussing. Is there a particular reason why there were only those originally those four? Is it because there were larger agencies or? 
sorry, I got to stop muting myself. I forgot it. Yeah, um, you, can, you, you know, I can't speak to the, to the um, original intent, but, but I'm, I'm fairly sure that the, that the initial focus was on social service agencies because um, of the sort of mission to expand access to, to programs and, and, and the sort of priority of, of, you know, better understanding those populations that are seeking services. Um, it, you know, it was the highest imperative. Um, would you require this bill will require this additional resources? And if so, uh, how much? Yes, um, it would. We're, we're in the process of evaluating exactly what those resources would entail. Um, I, I think one of the lessons that we learned the hard way, um, you know, was that there, there, there's no way to sort of sit back and, and just wait for agencies to tell us, um, you know, what meets the bill criteria and, and what doesn't. And the way that that um, data uh, is sort of decentralized across city government, it, it's usually um, at the program level where, where um, this data is sort of um, lives and, and, and not every CIO, for instance, is aware of it. So it, it really does take sustained work, year round sustained work um, to do this right, rather than just like a once a year um, kind of um, roundup. And, and, and the year-round sustained work is really also important for understanding what the, the agencies are encountering on the ground. You know, often they, they, these things can play out in very idiosyncratic ways. Um, and, and so understanding the challenges they're facing, um, you know, especially when a form is already long and complex is, is really important finding a solution. Okay, great. Yeah, we're definitely gonna need that number uh... To, to be able to get this uh, bill moving. How, how common is it for agencies to collect demographic information using, using city, I mean, rather, uh, using a state or federal form? Do city agencies ever edit or make this form? And if so, how and under what, what circumstances? Yeah, that, I got to stop muting myself. I'm so sorry. Um, I've been, you know, I conditioned myself for the last two years to hit that button every time I stop speaking. Um, so yes, we did encounter situations where the state or federal um, regulations made it impossible for us to, to change a form. Um, one example or two, two examples are both uh, associated with ACS. Um, for instance, when, when you know, we wanted to change the form to conform to this local law, um, the State Office of Family and Children's Services um, um, said no, um, they, they applied for a, a waiver um, but it was denied, and it turned out it was denied because the state needed us to comply with federal demographic reporting requirements. So we wow. have encountered kind of layers of, of you know, um, and, uh, of issues when it comes to the kind of state and federal oversight. Um, but but I but we were pleased, you know, um, to see that agencies are aggressively, you know, requesting waivers, and, and we support that that work also. You know, as you know, in Troll 1937, where we call the mayor's office of operation, you, your office to conduct a review of the forms city agencies use to collect demographic information. How much time will the administration need in order to complete this review? My last question. Yeah, we, we do think that this is a very involved task, again, because it's not sitting anywhere waiting to be discovered, that it, it requires a lot of outreach, even at the program level, to find every single um, instance of, of uh, public interaction where this sort of data is, is collected. So, so we do think it's more, you know, uh, in the range of years than months to, to sort of get all this stood up across all of city government. Um, but, but again, um, very much worth discussing further. Fantastic. Actually, we need to get started. <laughs> so if it's going to take years, the key here is to get it started. Well, I don't have any more questions. My colleagues don't. We'll move to the next panel, but thank you again. Thank you for the hard work uh, that you do right there at the Mayor's Office of Operation. Thank you again for your leadership and best of luck. Likewise. So with that, we'll go to the next panel, Committee Council. Thank you, Chair. We'll now hear from our fourth panel, which will be the final panel before we turn to public testimony. From the Department of Sanitation, testimony will be provided by Deputy Commissioner for Policy and External Affairs, Gregory Anderson. In addition, the following representatives will be available to answer questions. From the Department of Sanitation, Chief of Cleaning Operations, Stephen Harbin. From the Department of Transportation, Chief of Staff to the First Deputy Commissioner, Monty Dean. Assistant Commissioner for Intergovernmental and Community Affairs, Rebecca Zack. 
Director of Legislative Affairs, Benjamin Smith, and Assistant Director of Legislative Affairs, Miranda Alquist. Uh, and from the Department of Parks and Recreation, Chief Operating Officer, Mark Folkt, and Director of Government Relations, Matt Drury. Before we begin, I will administer the oath. Panelists, please raise your right hand. I will read the oath once and then call on each of you individually for a response. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Deputy Commissioner Anderson. I do. Chief Harbin. I do. Chief of Staff Dean. I do. Assistant Commissioner Zach. Do we have Assistant Commissioner Zach? We'll no. On. Great. Um, Chief Operating Officer Folkt. I do. And Director Drury. Do we have um, Matt Drury? Looks like we don't. Uh, yeah, okay. No, he, he's, he's on there, but we can't hear him. Oh. Director Drury, we can't hear you now. Um, if we can fix the audio issue, we can come back to you. Um, but for now, Deputy Commissioner Anderson, you may begin your testimony. Great, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Cabrera and members of the City Council Committee on Government Operations. Um, as the Committee Council mentioned, I'm Gregory Anderson, Deputy Commissioner for Policy and External Affairs at the New York City Department of Sanitation. I don't need to repeat the names of my colleagues who are all here um, to support for Q&A. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony on introduction 2409 on behalf of the administration. And given the number of topics that we've already heard on this uh, agenda, I'll keep my testimony somewhat brief. At sanitation, our mission is to keep New York City healthy, safe, and clean. Um, our frontline sanitation workers empty litter baskets, sweep the streets, pick up litter and dump trash, and manually clean public spaces across our city. While some of our core cleaning functions were cut or reduced during the COVID-19 pandemic, we have since restored funding for many of these ser services, including litter basket collection and syringe litter removal. We've also launched our precision cleaning initiative with teams that conduct targeted cleanings of litter conditions and illegal dumping. These conditions are eyesores that affect New Yorkers' quality of life and threaten New York City's recovery. This year, the city also created the City Cleanup Corps, Mayor de Blasio's New Deal-inspired program intended to foster the city's economic recovery by employing 10,000 New Yorkers to refresh and revitalize our city, to make it more welcoming to residents, workers, and tourists alike. Since its launch uh, six months ago, the Corps has contributed to, uh, significantly to cleaning the city's streets and sidewalks in neighborhoods across the five boroughs. At the program's peak, 3,200 of these Corps members served as new parks maintenance employees, helping to keep the city's 30,000 acres of parkland clean and safe. Whether serving on fixed post crews assigned to a given park, playground, or recreational facility, or as part of a mobile crew, crew traveling uh, from site to site as a team, parks maintenance workers are able to observe conditions in the spaces they care for, address issues as they arise, report serious concerns to their supervisors. Sector staff perform daily park maintenance, as well as garbage collection, mowing, snow plowing, and basic repairs and upkeep. Park staff are also tasked with cleaning a park for as long as, and as often it takes to make it clean and safe for the public. The agency has rigorous standards for cleanliness, safety, and cleaning frequency. And to ensure these standards are met, every park receives monthly inspections by sector supervisors, as well as at least two random audit inspections per year by highly trained inspectors, inspectors from the independently administered parks inspection program. Uh, DOT, the Department of Transportation, also continued working throughout the pandemic to do its part to keep New York City clean. DOT arterial maintenance employees work daily in all five boroughs to sweep roadways, pick up bulk debris, clear catch basins, repair attenuators, guide rails and fences, and fill potholes. Since the beginning of the City Cleanup Corps program, DOT has engaged dozens of Corps members to support its arterial maintenance program. Corps members worked alongside worked along major arterial corridors and adjacent areas, including exit ramps, center medians, shoulder areas, and more, and to date have removed more than 2,000 cubic yards of debris. In addition, over 100 core members supported operations, sanitation, and horticultural needs 
at 22 open street locations uh, through DOT's contract with the Horticultural Society of New York, prov uh, providing support in areas that were the hardest hit by COVID and have low existing partner capacity. Through the One NYC uh, Plaza Equity Program, DOT continued its work with its plaza partners to provide maintenance and operational support at 32 plazas in under-resourced neighborhoods. All 8.8 .8 million New Yorkers, as well as the millions of visitors and commuters have a role to play in keeping our city clean. Litter and trash doesn't just magically appear on city streets. Each piece or bag or pile has a person associated with it. Someone who tossed it on the ground, dumped it on the corner, threw it out a car window. As we recover and move along toward a post-COVID New York City, we ask all New Yorkers to do the right thing. Don't litter. Use litter baskets properly. Clean up after your pet. Move your car for alternate side parking. Sweep the sidewalk in front of your home or business. And if you see a litter condition that needs attention, please let us know by calling 311. Inter 2409 would delineate jurisdiction over various city properties for cleaning and maintenance purposes. In short, the bill assigns responsibility for arterial highways, including on and off ramps to DOT, for parks and planted areas to the parks department, and for all other areas, including center malls, underpasses, overpasses, step streets, and dead ends to DSNY. The bill also provides that any governmental body or agency having jurisdiction over a subway, railway, or other developed property clean alongside such property. This provision would apply to state or federal agencies and authorities, including the MTA, Port Authority, and Amtrak. The bill also requires that each city agency develop a web application to track the city's progress, to the agency's progress in cleaning its properties. Um, as Councilmember Miller mentioned in his opening statement, the bill largely codifies assignments created in the memorandum issued by Deputy Mayor for Operations, Matt Leventhal, during the Koch administration in 1983. Known as the Leventhal Memorandum, this document has for nearly four decades served as the ba basis for how the cleaning of these properties is distributed amongst the agencies. However, our approach to public spaces has changed over time, and particularly since 1983. Um, with the expansion of public plazas and bicycle, pedestrian, and tran transit infrastructure in the last decade. With these changes comes the need for flexibility and continuous improvement in the management of public space. The administration has a strong commitment to the vibrancy and cleanliness of our public spaces. When there is an issue at a particular location, we are committed to working together to find solutions to address the problem rather than pointing fingers or passing the buck. Each of the agencies represented here today shares your goal of keeping our city clean and improving the quality of life for New Yorkers in every neighborhood. The, under, the administration understands the impetus for this legislation and agrees with the intention of more clearly defining cleaning responsibilities for all manner of public properties and infrastructure across the city. We have some concerns that the strict and inflexible assignment of such responsibilities in the administrative code may preclude future improvement in the public realm and may not account for new categories of public spaces yet to be deployed uh, in New York. We look forward to, to further discussions with the council about the city's cleaning and maintenance programs. And once again, we remain committed to keeping our city and all of our public spaces healthy, safe, and clean. We look forward to working with the council to discuss these matters further and would now be happy to answer any questions you have. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for your testimony. I know council member Miller I uh, have some questions, so I'm going to start with him. I'm going to defer my questions to the end. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you, uh, Greg, uh, for, for, for being here um, and all of your support that we've gotten over there. So, so you know, we, we, we always say public policy happens by virtue of public discourse, right? And, and if there's anything that comes up quite often, it is the issue um, that we hope to address uh, in 2409. And that is, uh, how do we codify the responsibility of cleanup of, of these city properties? I, I don't think that there's, based on the amount of members that signed on to this bill in a very short period of time, I think this is common throughout the city of New York, a lot of finger pointing um, as to um, whose responsibility is, it is to uh, maintain and clean certain areas of the city. Um, I've had situations on uh, Springfield Boulevard, our main corridor in, in, in Southeast Queens, where fireworks, major firework productions were not cleaned up. 
So we're talking about from July 4th to probably after January of, of uh, 21 from, from, from 20. Uh, so uh, six to eight months later, where people drive past it every day and uh, agencies drive past it every day. Um, there are multiple complaints. How, how does that happen? Um, how does the information get filtered uh, through 311 to the proper agency as to whose responsibility it is to clean that up? And or when we see a, um, a couch at Parsons and Archer uh, uh, subway uh, uh, area, and we get this massive debate from DOT and, and sanitation um, and MTA in this case as to whose responsibility it is. Um, and, and, and clearly I appreciate your testimony, but it sounds like it was an easy fix, but these are the things that we go through every day. Um, is there something um, within the, me the Leventhal memo that has been changed uh, over the past uh, 40 years or some things that should have been changed um, and prevents agencies from expediting um, the maintenance of these properties uh, because of the vagueness of, of the uh, current uh, me uh, memo random and uh, is, is the, the codification of the memorandum justified in this case? Thank you, council member uh, for those questions. Um, and, and thank you as well for your partnership over the last eight years. I know we've worked together on a number of different issues. Um, so uh, it's been much appreciated the, the collaborative nature of, of our work. Um, so I'll, I'll start with um, the last part of the question, which um, specifically said it was to, you know, what has changed since the Leventhal memo? I mentioned a few things in the testimony, the pedestrian and, and bicycle infrastructure, um, additional tra transit infrastructure, things like um, bus bulbs, neck downs, um, things like that. In particular, uh, one thing that's totally new um, and, and really came about over the last uh, 15 or 20 years is the creation of the Green Streets program uh, by the New York City Parks Department. And uh, those are, are entirely landscaped areas. They're uh, maintained by the Parks Department. They're generally located in, in center medians um, in the roadway. Um, so that's, that's one specific example. There's also public plazas that DOT has worked to create um, and really dramatically expanded over the last uh, eight years. Um, those are just a few examples. Uh, to the specific locations that you mentioned, um, I'm not familiar with the fireworks on, on Springfield Boulevard, but if, if they're in the roadway, that's certainly our responsibility at sanitation. Um, 301 complaints about any dirty condition on a roadway or sidewalk should come to directly to the sanitation district and be addressed by that district. Um, we will certainly uh, look into those specific complaints in that location. Yeah, after this hearing well, and get back obviously, to you. yeah, obviously they're up, but they took about eight months. And the interesting thing about that is uh, one side is bordered by uh, South, the, the, the West side is bordered by Community Board 12, and the East side is bordered by Community Board 13, but each one goes past every day, including supervisors, and no one has thought to, to clean um, the medium. And this goes on for probably a half a mile, mile to half a mile, that is, is just um, not in a state of good repair. And, and everybody's kind of like just passing it off to the next person. And uh, so that would be, and I, I don't want to believe this. I think this is cut and dry and it's, it's simple. Um, but do we believe that? And, and because these are the things that have not come to be because we now have pedestrian ways. I think the pedestrian ways usually come with a maintenance agreement from a not-for-profit or something that, that would, would maintain it, um, usually not uh, a, a big responsibility placed on uh, city agencies in, in terms of those, in, in, at least in my district. Um, but is there something that we're missing or can we expect with the codification of the, of, of, of the uh, uh, Leventhal memo that these, these uh, situations would be addressed? And I would just add that um, I, I would question 
whether or not, because you, you did mention that this would include the authorities such as the MTA. I, I think that anyone uh, within the city of New York knows that the commuter rails are like the absolute worst community partners you can have in terms of maintenance, which means that they, they barely shovel snow. Um, they, they hardly ever clean up. Uh, we do community cleanups anywhere around the Long Island Railroad just about every week uh, in, in, in district there. And we have six sites in district. Um, they have been the worst partners. We have since asked, because uh, we didn't have time for a resolution, uh, my, my, my colleagues in, in, uh, in the state Senate and assembly uh, to, to uh, produce legislation that would authorize them uh, which, 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 which would um, mandate that they clean their property here in the city. Would this have an impact on that at all? That, you know, cause they're saying that they, you know, they'll do the sidewalks, but they don't do on this paths and other things like that. And it's also the, the, the snow removal and the ice removal that's obviously a matter of health and safety. Yeah, thank, thank you for that question, council member. I think there are some challenges um, just constitutionally regarding our ability to enforce against state authorities, um, state agencies, federal agencies, um, just because the city itself is a creature of the state under the mm -hmm. New York State Constitution. Um, so, you know, while, while we could, while it certainly would clearly state that they are responsible for their properties, it wouldn't necessarily um, change what's happening on the ground. I think we are um, certainly in, in a new day in terms of the city's relationship with Albany, um, the new governor, uh, there happens to be a, a former sanitation commissioner in a, in a high ranking position uh, in the governor's office who I know works very closely with the MTA on a regular basis. So I think you know, we're, we're optimistic that that relationship um, will continue to change for the better and that um, hopefully we can work in partnership. Um, it doesn't have to be an us or them, it can be an us and them who has the resources at the at you know this moment in time to get something clean? Sanitation and certainly under Commissioner Grayson has been committed to cleaning anything that that anyone raises to us, even if it's not our property under the Leventhal Agreement. We will send a crew out there. We'll send a crew to the Spring, Springfield Boulevard today. We will get that. Oh, they're, they're good today. Done. They're good today. The railroads are good. Santa DSNY has done yeoman's work I, absolutely, but we get we get folks. Um, and, and, it's, and you know what, as, as I watch the social media, it's everywhere in the city that we've been inundated with dumping in these places. And it's often these kind of sites that we're looking at and, and, and DSNY is taking a hit and, 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 and the council and, and city agencies are taking a hit. And quite frankly, it may or may not be a city property at all, right? And, and, and so um, they just have not been good partners. I, I hope that the relationship with you know uh with with the, with, with advisor uh garcia uh really uh comes to fruition but um the same way we're we're attempting to codify the responsibilities i, I would love to do to be able to do the same um you know because this thing is ever moving right and we don't know um what what a handshake agreement means uh four years from now or, or next year and whether or not um it's even relevant and so should we um, if this does not extend to uh, a state authority, then, you know, should we proceed with the resolution and or, um, you know, uh, uh, the state colleagues actually um, introducing legislation as well. I don't want to take too much time. It seems to be cut and dry. I just want to make sure that, that we're getting to where we need to get to and, and that there's no... Um, um, uh, misunderstandings amongst agencies as to what and whom responsibilities are or what, because I mean, we're just seeing it. And, 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 and obviously at this level, everybody agrees what their responsibilities are, but we're seeing on the ground, you know, things happening and not getting picked up, you know, and it's like, oh, it's not us, it's them. So as long as you're okay, we're okay. So I'm, I'm, I'm trusting in agencies to do the right thing in this one, as what we're saying, right, Chair? Thank That's you. right. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and Councilmember, I, I will reassure you, as I mentioned in my testimony, we remain committed 
to addressing the actual problems, not pointing fingers. Um, so, and, and the, the great thing that these agencies do, and, and I personally work with, um, with DOT and parks on an almost daily basis, um, discussing these things, discussing how we can help each other out. And that's really the approach that we've taken is, um, you know, not about whose fault is it and whose problem is it, but what resources can we bring to the table really, uh, addressing these, um, these issues as they come up. And you're absolutely right. We've, we've seen a real, um, a real scourge of illegal dumping over the last year and a half. We've stepped up our enforcement efforts tremendously. We thank the council for increasing the, the penalty for illegal dumping from 1500 to 4,000 uh, a year and a half ago. Um, and we continue to, to, to increase these efforts, installing additional surveillance cameras to try to catch illegal dumping in the act. Um, but it's, it's been a real, a real uphill battle for us. Oh, and on that, uh, can I just ask on implementation, can we expect the implementation of, uh, or, or um, for, for cameras to be up and running this year before the end of the year? Uh, before the end of the calendar year? I, I, I don't right. know if that's the case. Um, we're certainly funded for, to purchase a number of cameras this fiscal year, and we're working through the procurement right now to get that done. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you so much, oh. uh, Council Member, for leading in this uh, in this bill. That I'm telling you, I don't think there's a council member that, at one point or another, has not been in this position where you call and you have two agencies saying, uh, "No, that's not my job. That's somebody else's job." And let me just qualify that by saying. My experience with Department of Sanitation and with parks has been amazing in the last 12 years. Um, so responsive. But this this is a real issue. I mean, it happened in my district. And uh, nobody wanted to pick up in a landing right by some steps. Nobody wanted to pick it up. I mean, it took, it took me getting the media involved. And then, ironically, uh, it, it got done. Um, and so I think clarity and uh, now uh, through this bill uh, is going to make it uh, a lot easier. But with that, let me ask you a question. If somebody were to ask, let's say if, I, if I was calling in my, area, in my district uh, for an area that is not being clean or maintained, how can I find out from the get-go which agency is responsible for that area? Thank you, uh, Chair Cabrera, um, for that question. I mean, in, in general, sanitation is responsible for cleaning public spaces. Um, it's, our, it's part of our mandate under the charter. Um, I don't have the exact charter language in front of me right now, but you know, we, we, we were created as the Department of Street Cleaning. We are now the Department of Sanitation. We are responsible for keeping New York City clean. Um, there are select locations, um, for example, landscaped uh, areas, park areas that fall under the Parks Department. Um, and that makes sense because, you know, they have forestry staff, they have landscapers, they have horticulturalists that can maintain not just the, the ground itself, but the plants and, um, and really understand what the needs of those spaces are. There are other places, um, particularly uh, highways and, and arterial roadways, um, particularly limited access roadways that fall under DOT. And that makes sense because they have the, the expertise in those spaces. They have the equipment, the attenuators, the um, you know, specialized mechanical brooms to be able to clean those locations. Everything else in general falls under sanitation. And I would say it's always a safe bet to come to sanitation first, because even if it's something that we don't believe is our responsibility long-term, we are happy to send a supervisor out there, address whatever condition we can address. If it's behind a fence or something like that, it gets a little bit more complicated, but if there's something on the roadway, on the sidewalk, on an overpass, under an underpass, you know, we will, we will allocate the resources to get that, uh, to get that cleaned up. So, you know, in the steps, uh, when you're trying to connect from one community to another, you got a big slope, and then there's usually some landing for little benches. Who's responsible for that? So cleaning the, the cleaning of those spaces is, is the responsibility of sanitation. Um, and you know, where where 
we can run into challenges sometimes is just having the resources to be able to maintain all of those spaces. Um, we had a program prior to COVID-19, our JTP program. That's those uh, participants in that program were, were the, the resources that we used in many cases to clean the step streets. It was suspended during the pandemic. We are beginning to ramp that up right now. Um, the City Cleanup Corps has been doing a great job uh, with spaces like that, cleaning up litter, beautifying the spaces, um, cleaning graffiti from them. Um, but in general, sanitation is, is responsible for cleaning those areas. Thank you so much. Last question, uh, because we do have members of the public who want to testify. Uh, and again, let me just, I, I'm going to be redundant on purpose. Uh, overall, uh, in my district, in my district, the Department of Sanitation and Parks, uh, you guys have been amazing. So I really appreciate all the effort and all the work that you have put into my district. Uh, but my last question in, in terms of the Miller, let me call it the Miller time, uh, bill here, number 2409, do, does it require any other resources? So I, I think that's a, that's a tricky question, council member. We can always do more with more. Um, it, it's, it's, it's always, you know, when, when you're talking about manpower, it's hard to do more with less. Um, so if we had more resources, we could certainly always do more work. Um, this year, as I mentioned in testimony, we created the Precision Cleaning Initiative. That has been incredibly helpful. That's nine teams a day that we send out specifically to clean eyesore conditions, specifically to illegal dumping or overflowing litter baskets. Um, they have been incredibly productive. So sure, if, if we had more resources like that, um, you know, more, more funding for, for manual cleaning, we absolutely could do more. Um, we, we think right now we're at a place where, where we can meet our commitment to having a clean and vibrant New York City. Um, and if there are places where, uh, that you're aware of that have uh, conditions or issues right now, we wanna know where they are so we can address those uh, right now. Yeah, my, my, my only thing, the only thing that I would um, add would be that the Bronx uh, would get more uh, sanitation workers proportionally. And you know how the routes go, which I'm not gonna take time to explain right now. It just makes it, um, we have an inequity in terms of how many workers we have here. So in the next plan, um, if that could be taken into consideration, I brought this up to the commissioner twice. He agreed that I was correct in my assessment and the numbers that I brought. Uh, I just, I, I like to see a, a point of action there. But again, thank you so much. Really appreciate uh, your testimony uh, and your support of, of this bill. And so with that, we move, uh, let me turn it back to the committee council. Thank you, Chair. We'll now turn to public testimony. Please be advised that for this portion of the hearing, we'll be calling on individuals one by one to testify. Each panelist will be given three minutes to speak. Please begin once the sergeant has started the timer. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the Zoom raise hand function, and I will call on you after the panelist has completed their testimony. For panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you, and uh, the sergeant at arms will set the timer and give you the go ahead to begin. Please wait for the sergeant to announce that you may begin before delivering your testimony. I'd now like to welcome Ian Vandevarker to testify, followed by Tom Speaker and then Sarah Goff. Ian Vandevarker, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Counting starts now. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Ian Vandevarker, senior counsel with the Democracy Program at the Brennan Center for Justice at NYU School of Law. I'm here to testify concerning uh, introduction 2429, which the Brennan Center strongly opposes. This bill would needlessly increase mayoral control over the budget of the campaign finance board. Uh, the agency already has adequate oversight from elected officials. The mayor and the speaker of the council appoint its members and the budget is ultimately controlled by the council. <clears throat> At the same time, the CFB is unique among agencies at risk of political retaliation officials who uh, it regulates. Some degree of independence for the CFB must be carefully protected, especially at a time 
the administration of elections is facing dangerous political attacks across the country. The system of small donor public financing is the most powerful solution available to counter the corrosive effects of uh, big money in our politics. And it requires adequate resources to engage uh, for the agency to engage in fair and efficient oversight. As a campaign finance agency, the CFB is unlike any other government body. It is in the unique position of enforcing rules against the elected officials who control the policies and budgets that it needs. This invites politicians to trim an agency's budget if they prefer weak enforcement or if they wanna retaliate for past enforcement actions. This has happened in other jurisdictions including the federal uh, system. And there's fortunately no way to predict that it won't happen here in New York City in the future without uh, uh, institutional protection. <clears throat> As the 1998 uh, Charter Revision Commission put it, the CFB is uniquely vulnerable to political pressures through the uncertainty of the budget process. The Commission's reasoning is just as true today as it was 20 years ago. Um, and the system has worked for 20 years and we expect it to keep working in the future. We therefore recommend that the council reject introduction 2429. Thank you. Thank you. I'd now like to welcome Tom Speaker to testify followed by Sarah Goff and then Ben Weinberg. Tom Speaker, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Time starts now. Good morning, Chair Cabrera and members of the Governmental Operations Committee. My name is Tom Speaker, and I am a policy analyst at reInvent Albany, a watchdog organization that advocates for open and accountable government. Today, we are testifying on an intro 2429 of 2021 and intro 1901 of 2020. Uh, I'll begin by addressing 2429. We are one of 27 groups that strongly oppose intro 2429. We believe this bill would undermine the independence and effectiveness of the nationally recognized New York City Campaign Finance Board, and that it would also weaken democracy in New York City. I will highlight two points from the joint memo of opposition that we have submitted to the council. First, the CFB is currently effectively allowed to set its own budget to prevent interference from the very elected officials that the agency oversees. The New York City Charter says that the mayor shall include the CFB's requested funds in the executive budget without revision. This bill would remove that requirement. When this provision was approved in 1998 by New York City voters as part of a ballot proposal, the Charter Revision Commission's report explicitly stated that this independent budgeting would help protect the CFB from political meddling. In Hawaii, Maine, and many other states, campaign finance boards without an independent budget have seen their funding streams cut or threatened. If intro 2429 passes, we expect council members or mayors with an ax to grind to try to squeeze the CFB the same way. Second, as the public matching program has expanded, the New York City Council has become increasingly diverse and more reflective of the New York City electorate. Last year's primary elections were the first in which candidates could receive an eight to one match on donations. And next year's city council will be the first in which 61% of the council members are women, up from 27% and 67% of the council members are people of color, up from 51%. We believe intro 2429 is bad policy. If you approve it, this law would damage a New York City campaign finance system that is an extraordinary success in national model and that has steadily improved over time. If it ain't broke, don't break it. Please vote no on intro 2429. Regarding intro 1901, we do support this bill which would allow the public to see who is funding independent expenditures to pass or defeat New York City ballot proposals and referendums. New York City needs more transparency in our elections, particularly as dark money spending continues to increase both in the city and across the country. Thank you for allowing me to testify. I welcome any questions you may have. Thank you. I'd now like to welcome Sarah Goff to testify, followed by Ben Weinberg. And then Kathleen Collins. Sarah Goff, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Time starts now. Good afternoon. I'm Sarah Goff, Deputy Director of Common Cause New York. I'd like to thank Chair Cabrera for convening today's committee hearing. As many of you know, Common Cause New York is a nonpartisan citizens lobby and a leading force in the battle for honest and accountable government for the, over the last 50 years. I'd like to briefly outline our position on three of the bills before today's committee. We support INT 1901, 
which will increase transparency and instill greater public confidence in ballot proposal campaigns. While they are not exceedingly commonplace, we opened one local ballot campaign committee in 2019, as earlier noted in today's hearing, and we were keenly aware of the discrepancy between state and local reporting requirements for ballot campaign committees. We therefore applaud any moves that enhances the disclosure of donors and expenditures to the general public. We also fully support the enhanced transparency requirements through the inclusion of paid for by and the top three donors disclosure on any public facing communications and or in any direct voter contact. For the other two bills, we oppose INT 2453. We believe that the recent increase in matching funds program obviates the need for relief for independent expenditure spending, as we saw in the last election cycle. We conducted our own analysis, and as we saw, IEs certainly have increased their spending, but candidates did not seem to be hindered by the increase in candidate spending. We found that under current expenditure guidance, despite the increase in IE spending, very few participating candidates hit the expenditure threshold, and candidates in individual races handily outspent IEs. Uh, provision 6A specifically of this bill is too low for us to support, and we believe that it would simply serve to undercut both the spirit and letter of the New York City Public Financing Program. Our analysis shows that this would pave the way for unnecessary and increased candidate spending in our municipal elections. We also have concerns that under current provisions of this bill, the relief would only serve to favor candidates who are prolific fundraisers and disadvantage those who are not. And similar to our colleagues and other panelists, we oppose INT 2429 for similar reasons. Uh, to briefly note, too often mayors and council members are inclined to play politics with agency buddies, budgets, excuse me, and in, it is with that acknowledgement voters approved the change to the budget process for the CFB in 1998. A rollback of this voter approved provision would undoubtedly dilute the independence of the CFB and more than likely hamper its ability to administer the city's public financing program. Thank you very much for your time and I'm happy to answer any questions anyone might have. Thank you. I'd now like to welcome Kathleen Collins to testify, followed by Monica Bartley. And then, oh, excuse me. I'd now like to welcome Ben Weinberg to testify, followed by Kathleen Collins and then Monica Bartley. Uh, ben Weinberg, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Thank you, Council. Time starts now. Thank you for the opportunity to speak before the committee today. My name is Ben Weinberg, and I am the Director of Public Policy at Citizens Union. I would ask to make remarks on several bills before the committee. I'll start with intro 2453, uh, sponsored by Council Member Lander, which would provide spending limit relief for participating candidates who face high spending IEs. Citizens Union supports this goal, but has reservation with how intro 2453 is currently drafted, and we believe it could lead to unintended and unfair consequences. First, the bill would allow the candidates benefiting from high spending IEs to utilize this relief, thus defeating the purpose of leveling the playing field uh, in that race. For example, in this if this provision had existed in the last election cycle, the 10 city council candidates who received the largest support from IEs would actually have their spending limit raised by half. Uh, we believe that uh, participating candidates who are defending from high spending IEs should be afforded the spending time uh, relief and not the candidates benefiting from IE spending. Second, the proposed 50% threshold of this uh, bill could potentially apply to dozens of races, as mentioned earlier by the CFP. This could amount to a de facto change uh, of the spending limit in the campaign finance program and might incentivize candidates to seek the support of IEs. We recommend the council to consider the fiscal implications, the programmatic needs um, that are needed to support the implementation of this bill and to request more data to be collected before moving this bill forward. Intro 1901, which would expand donor disclosure requirements for IEs that spend money on municipal ballot proposals, um, strengthen, would strengthen the city's ability to regulate um, the increasing flow of outside money to all types of local elections. 
we saw the results of um, um, big spending on uh, ballot proposals in this November statewide elections. And we've seen in the last few local referenda cycles, um, also about one and a half million dollars spent in, in IE uh, spending. The city would be wise to defend future, uh, defend from future um, ballot proposal campaigns by allowing voters to know who is uh, funding the campaigns meant to convince them to vote for one way or another. Uh, lastly, I will join the opposition of my colleagues and some council members in regards to um, intro 2429, which would reduce the independence of the campaign finance board. Citizens Union believe this bill would not improve budget transparency. It won't change the structure of the CFP budget or how it is presented publicly. Um, nor would it change the council's powers to amend the budget um, and um, hold any oversight hearings as it wishes. Uh, thank you for the opportunity I'm to be here today, and um, I welcome any questions in the future. Thank you. I'd now like to welcome Kathleen Collins to testify, followed by Monica Bartley and then Cesar Ru Ruiz. Kathleen Collins, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Time starts now. Thank you for letting me testify before you here today. I am a co-coordinator at Downstate New York ADAPT and I'm one of the co-coordinators for our voter engagement working group. I'm going to be kind of quick here. As to intro 1901, we agree that this bill should be enacted into law as is. With respect to intro 2453, we do support this bill in theory. However, it does need to be edited and we, I won't belabor that point, uh, Mr. Weinberg was eloquent on that, and we just agree with him. Uh, with respect to intro 2429, we strenuously uh, oppose that bill, and we uh, support the other people and what they've already stated concerning that bill. So I won't belabor that point. The final one is intro 2438, and that's concerning the voter's guide, which we strongly support its passage but it does need a few revisions. Uh, we don't have enough time here to go into that. We will, uh, we will be submitting written testimony concerning that. And we'd also like the um, uh, Councilwoman Rosenthal to reach out to us at dnyadapt at gmail.com. That's uh, dnyadapt at gmail.com. That's for Downstate New York Adapt. And just one final thing I'd just like to note is unlike um, the city council who has all these hearings on Zoom and never engages its free uh, closed captioning that it could. It's not perfect, but it is AI closed captioning. It, it's free and you never engage it until after the uh, time period for people to submit their comments, which is a total violation of our due process rights. And I don't understand why you do that, yet the campaign finance board has had several voter advisors Voter Assistance Advisory Committee public hearings where they have had closed captioning, ASL interpreters, audio descriptions. Uh, they've had everything, yet the city council doesn't. I, you know, and, and, you, and you want to attack the campaign finance board, which is doing such a great job. And then also at, they have meetings with us in the public of various organizations. And at those meetings, we pointed out to them about their AI closed captioning and now they engage it. So, and with that, we can not only have people who have difficulty hearing look at it, it's not perfect. I mean, it would be better if we had caught, but it's something and it's free. And also you can then download it and save it for people who have difficulty taking notes. So I just don't understand why, what's happening here with the city council, a violation of all civil rights. Thank you. Thank you. I'll now turn it over to Council Member Rosenthal for questions. Oh, great. Thank you so much. I didn't. I, thank you so much, Kathleen. Uh, you repeated your email address twice, and I only got half of it. So, could I ask you to repeat it one more time? I am going to reach out to you. Sure. And I would like every council person to refuse to come to any meeting in the future that doesn't allow for AI closed caption because. You are all violating the law. I mean, it's free. What is this? And even I was concerned about what I saw about the OMB and about ASL interpreters. What is that? It's our civil rights that you're violating. 
I mean, what that has nothing to do with money. And this is New York City. New York City has a budget that's bigger than many countries. And you're going to tell me that you can't afford to have ASL interpreters at every meeting, and you can't afford to have a, the free closed captioning. We 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 live on a budget. We don't even have a, about. We have less than two hundred dollars in our in our things downstate. And we we have a friend that provides us with uh, Zoom, and we use the. I mean, it's not perfect, but we have the AI closed captioning. And when we can, we do the other. You know, we try to do ASL when people request because we we don't have that much money to afford it. But I just don't understand city. Um, yes, my um, downstate New York adapt is dnyadapt at gmail.com. And I really am surprised that you should all, I just don't understand why you don't. It's all civil right and it's free and you still don't do it. And I brought this up to I brought this up to the speaker when they did the zoning for accessibility. They had none of that. They, I brought it up to my councilwoman. I brought it up to, so I brought it up to the um, the committee on technology. And you see me say it in my testimony. And three days later, they have the closed captioning. It looks totally idiotic, but they didn't have it during the meeting nor during the seventy two hours where you can put in comments, which is clear violation of due process rights. Thank you, I'm sorry. No, please don't apologize. I, your frustration is inspirational. It's and getting to the point where we have to sue, like we always have to sue. We constantly have to sue the government to get what is ours as of right. And I pay taxes, I'm a lawyer. I pay taxes, a lot of taxes over the years. I've, I've lived in New York City, I mean, I, I was born and bred here. So uh, my whole life, I'm 64 years old now. And I've paid a lot of taxes, you know? So I just, and I've, and I work for a living. I mean, you know, I know they always think people with disabilities don't work, we're all on the dole. I know that attitude, but we're not. And I, I'm, I just, and you don't do this. To, what if you did this to any other group? You told women, sorry, ladies, you can't be in on any of these meetings. There would be an outcry. But there isn't for us. And not even the other good government groups have pointed this out. I, I'm, I, I can't believe this. Everybody says they want to, they all come to us right before the election, but then after the election, we don't exist. So thank you. Except for the campaign it, finance board, they, they listened to us. Yes, they had a good pilot, right? No, no, it's just it's a pilot. They've been listening to us constantly. And, and, and doing things. Maybe I meant I live on the ASL, but yeah. Yeah, they're, they're listening. Just, yeah. Listen, yeah. You're, you're, you're articulating the concern of hundreds of thousands of people in New York City, and they are all lucky to have you. Um, it, it's not just that we should not only have it the AI, but also that you can download it because I know that helps me tremendously, even at the campaign finance board meetings I go to now, I download the transcript because it helps me know what the what was talked about. And and it's free. We're having a thing on this tomorrow uh, with the, and maybe we should have somebody from the city council go to it so they can see how, what little button they have to click. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. I'm I was testifying on another hearing. I was multitasking. Diaz, I think you asked me a question, did you? And I'm really sorry that I looked like I Thank you, uh, we'll move on. Um, I'd now like to welcome Monica Bartley to testify, followed by Cesar Ruiz and then Nicole Gordon. Uh, Monica Bartley, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. The time starts now. Good afternoon, Chair Cabrera and members of the Governmental Operations Committee. I'd like to thank you for allowing me this opportunity to testify. My name is Monica Bartley and I'm a community organizer at the Center for Independence of the Disabled New York, Sydney. 
Sydney is a leading advocate for New Yorkers of all ages with all types of disabilities. Sydney's goal is to ensure full integration, independence, and equal opportunity for all people with disabilities by removing barriers to the social, economic, cultural, and civic life of the community. Part of Sydney's mission is to ensure the full participation of individuals with disabilities in the electoral process and to encourage those who are eligible to do so. Some members of the disability community do not participate in the electoral process because they are not fully informed. Voters who are deaf and hard of hearing are left behind as they lack information about candidates, ballot proposals, and other related information. It is evident throughout the electoral system as ASL interpreters are not available at poll sites and poll workers cannot communicate effectively with voters who are deaf. Sometimes the language on the ballot is hard to understand for those who use primarily American Sign Language. Without equal access to information, some voters are excluded from the process as they are excluded from this hearing today with the lack of captioning and ASL. Sydney fully supports intro 2438, which requires the Campaign Finance Board to publish video voter guides in English, American Sign Language, and the top six official languages spoken by the population of New York City. In addition, including captions for each such language for each candidate for local elections would broaden the scope and reach of the electoral platform to include people who lack proficiency in English language. The publication of video voter guides with captions and ASL would benefit people in the disability population, in particular people who are deaf and hard of hearing. Some people may prefer one over the other or need to draw from both for full comprehension. So it's important to include both. In addition, it would be helpful if candidates are given the opportunity to provide an audio description so people who are blind can visualize the person. The introduction of video voter guides would improve public awareness of the candidates, ballot proposals, so citizens can make informed decision on their candidates of choice. Sydney supports the law to amend the New York City Charter and the administration code of the city of New York concerning video voter guides. So we urge that you sign intra 2438 into law. Thank you very much. Thank you. Council member Rosenthal, did you have another question? I did. Thank you so much, Ms. Bartley. I really want to thank you for your testimony. Um, and again, if you could uh, send it in both to the city council and copy me as well, I really appreciate that. I have a specific question for you. Um, do you have any thoughts? And if you don't, feel free to just email me with your thoughts or to anyone on the panel um, about how we address a Braille version of the physical voter guide. Um, is there a way, should we be, should one section be in Braille um, as we have five different languages um, in the document? Should a, should a sixth section be in Braille um, or is there another way to address it. Um, yeah, if you could speak to that first, and then I have another question for you. The issue of Braille is one that I would not want to comment on making it um, universal. I would rather say Braille upon request, because some blind people prefer to have an audio version because printing it in Braille produces a very huge document. And I do not want to comment any further because this one is something that can be debated. So I would rather we have a committee to examine this. Right. Um, and I'm hearing you say um, a limited version, perhaps. 
in yes. in braille yes that could be distributed via organizations that serve the blind perhaps right on request uh, on upon request great thank you so much for that um yeah if i just can confirm you're going to submit your testimony i really appreciate that yes i already did so but i'll also okay. send you a copy i We'll move on. I'd now like to welcome Cesar Ruiz to testify, followed by Nicole Gordon and then Lloyd Fang. Cesar Ruiz, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Time starts now. Greetings, Chair Cabrera, fellow council members and community members. Thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today. My name is Cesar Ruiz. I'm an Equal Justice Legal Fellow uh, working with Latino Justice Pro Def in the area of voting rights and redistricting. Latino Justice Pearl Def is a Latinx civil rights organization dedicated to protecting the rights of Latino community members across the nation. Since its inception in 1972, we have worked tirelessly to ensure that Latinos have equitable access to our electoral system. In that same vein, we take a moment here to express our support of Intro 2438 while identifying key areas of need to be considered in its adoption. Uh, we support this measure with an understanding that video messaging is an effective tool to engage prospective voters. New York City's recent uh, ranked choice voting educational campaign and use of videos in that effort serve as a gleaming example of the power of video messaging. Uh, as 95% of voters surveyed by Common Cause and Ranked the Vote in its recent ranked choice exit polling found that ranked choice ballot was simple to complete and 78% of New Yorkers said that they understood ranked choice voting extremely or very well. Furthermore, we understand this measure to be an effective tool for engaging ethnic and language minority groups as large percentages of language and ethnic minority group members polled stated that they understood ranked choice voting and also found their ballots simple to complete. Given these findings, it's clear that video messaging can help fully inform current and prospective voters in a way that allows them to be an active and engaged participant in the electoral process. Thus, we commend the council on its efforts to expand access through intro 2438. While we are in support of the core of the proposed bill, we want to highlight a few areas of concern that we urge the council to consider in its adoption. First, although the bill proposes that New York City Campaign and Finance Board would publish the material online, we urge the adoption of language which would also require that the video voter guides be advertised on local media channels and other forms of advertising to ensure that it reaches all uh, sectors of the New York population. The idea that this information would only be available if individuals can or have access to internet would defeat the purpose of expanding accessibility and voter education. Thus, we urge the adoption of language that create access in a meaningful way to all voters, especially Spanish dominant voters where language access issues have historically prevented them from fully and freely exercising their right to vote. Second, we also urge the adoption of language that would create a more robust process of outreach to language minority community members and community-based organizations to derive effective and comprehensive messaging regarding the paper and video voter guides to properly inform language minority voters of what precisely is on the ballot. As the recent failures of ballot proposal one, three, and four show, there are serious issues in development of effective messaging, which in turn disparately impact language minority community members. A recent Spectrum One news reports that a striking 13% of New Yorkers left ballot proposal one blank. That number increases as we assess the impact, particularly on boroughs with larger proportions of language minority group members. For example, in Bronx County, where Latinos form a majority of the population, 4.8%, we saw that 26% of voters left ballot proposal one blank. The disparity shown here speaks to a lack of effective messaging aimed at language minority group members and an overall failure to create materials that engage them in a way that allows them to effectively cast their vote. Meaningfully creating access for minority group members means developing resources which will speak to their needs in relation to casting their ballot. Adding language which creates a process that engages community members in the production of paper and video voter guides will ensure that these resources increase access by allowing language access minority group members advocacy groups to define the areas of needs and for those needs to be addressed in that process. A few examples of ways and I'll, I'll just cut the other points and I'll submit written testimony on this as well. Um, one point that I wanted to clarify was uh, limiting the use of hyper-technical terminology and messaging and focusing on accessible language so that community members can meaningfully understand. Um, and lastly, we wanna urge uh, adoption of language that would create a continuous voter education program through video and paper voter guides for new eligible votes. Currently, the city publishes an online voter guide 
um, and does the paper guide that is mailed out for general elections, expanding those efforts beyond the current level would greatly increase access, ensuring that all voters are consistently engaged and aware of the upcoming primary and general elections. Thank you so much. Thank you. I see Council Member Rosenthal has her hand raised. I do, thank you. So if I understand properly, oops, am I unmuted? Yes, oh, okay, sorry. Um, so if I understand your testimony, you're in support of the bill, you wanna add to it yes. requirements of advertising, et cetera. Is that, am I hearing you right? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you very much. I look forward to reading your testimony. Thank you. I'd now like to welcome Nicole Gordon to testify, followed by Lloyd Fang. Nicole Gordon, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Time starts now. Uh, I, I, you'll have my written testimony, so I don't want to get into any detail about uh, what's under discussion here um, about uh, the budget uh, provisions um, uh, applied to this campaign finance board. I do want to thank you, Chairman uh, Cabrera, for your kind words uh, to the board and staff of the campaign finance board. I was the first um, executive director of the New York City Campaign Finance Board. I served in that capacity for almost 18 years. I'm very proud of uh, the, the staff uh, and the board from that time and up to now. Um, and I uh, want to say in particular, Chairman uh, Cabrera, that you, <clears throat> your, your comment that it's a tough job is <laughs> could not be more <laughs> appropriate. Uh, Nonpartisanship in operations is hard to legislate but it is a culture at the campaign finance board. And I would just caution you that the, camp the city council should be incredibly proud of this program, having also passed it in addition to the charter, uh, having been adopted and um, should be incredibly proud and incredibly cautious about anything that might diminish any aspect of the work of the campaign finance board. Once that happens, uh, it is very hard to correct. And especially in a situation here when the um, premise is incredible, it's just not persuasive. Thanks very much. Thank you. I'd now like to welcome Lloyd Fang to testify. Lloyd Fang, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Time starts now. Thank you, Chair Cabrera and the committee for including our testimony on intro 1937 today and bill sponsor Councilmember Drum for his tireless championing of the data disaggregation cause. My name is Lloyd Fang policy coordinator at the Coalition for Asian American Children and Families, CACF. For 35 years, CACF has led the fight in New York City for improved and equitable policies, systems, and services to support those most marginalized in the AAPI community. We're a member organization with over 70 AAPI-led uh, members and partners serving the AAPI community, which is the fastest growing population in New York City, comprising up to 18% of the city's total population. In addition to the proposed changes already in intro 1937, CACF would like to offer recommendations focused on three areas. One, form development, two, data collection and form administration, and three, data publication. In the form development phase, we propose the following changes. One, define an inclusive and standardized criteria for deciding which top 30 largest ancestry group and languages spoken categories appear in city agency forms so that even when populations fluctuate and ancestry groups and languages spoken technically are no longer in the top 30, such categories remain specified on the forms. Two, ensure the highest standards of language accessibility by offering such forms in at least the top 30 language groups spoken in New York City are available in electronic and paper format across city agencies and that competent translators and uh, or timely translation services are available for city residents to use when filling out such forms. Three, ensure forms include questions that ask and record the reasons for which the respondent originally contacted the city agency. Uh, in the data collection and form administration phase, we recommend the following. One, develop clear benchmarks for when intentional data collection and form administration efforts in each agency um, should occur. Two, stipulate proper training for agency employees and volunteers involved in form admin grounded in cultural humility 
and in meeting our communities where they are. Uh, in the data publication phase, we recommend the following. One, mandate specific deadlines during each year by which city agencies must have collected such data and when the Office of Operations must release such data to the public. Two, mandate that the Office of Operations present the data collected in a format and with tools that are easy for the public's diverse end users to use. Um, finally, uh, I just wanted to say we must implement data aggregation properly, beginning with a robust comprehensive revision bill um, that compels city agencies to effectively implement the policy or otherwise risk of uh, perpetuating the cycle of neglect and lack of understanding that continues to harm our communities. Thank you so much to Chair Cabrera. Congratulations on uh, ending your you know, tenure and the committee for your time today. We at CACF are happy to help as you determine how best to craft the language in the vision bill so that city agencies can collect better data on who they serve and thus better serve all New Yorkers. Thank you so much. Thank you. I believe we've now gone through all of our registered witnesses who are on the call. So at this time, if your name has not been called and you wish to testify, please use the Zoom raise hand function. And seeing no hands raised, I'll turn it over to Chair Cabrera for closing remarks. Thank you so much. And again, uh, I wanna thank uh, all the advocacy groups. You do an amazing amount of work. Uh, often unknown by the general public, uh, but you do move the needle and you make us also better. So I wanna thank you all for, in my experience, the last 12 years working here in the council for all the contributions that you have made. Uh, the former uh, director of CFB, thank you for those words. My, my phone, I had to switch, uh, I had to switch uh, technology here, uh, so I, I was muted. Uh, but thank you for those words. Uh, and in these, the work in CFB is 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 hardiest. It's tough. It's 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 very difficult. Government is not easy uh, at any level uh, because decision making uh, is. Uh, decisions are made on a daily basis. They literally impact. And you have groups pulling from uh, different uh, interest groups. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's all about the people. It's all about the people. And so with that, I wanna thank again, CJ Mary. Thank you, you've done a fabulous job. I'm Sebastian Bacci, you made my job so much easier and so much enjoyable. Um, uh, I wish we had Elizabeth Cronk and Emily Forjong, uh, who, uh, but what a team. We, we had great times working together and just brainstorming and it just made it such a pleasurable experience. Uh, and my uh, director of legislative affairs, uh, Clark Pena, uh, who I know is listening right now, thank you for all the fantastic work that you have done. Sergeant of Arms, uh, and my colleagues uh, in this uh, wonderful committee, uh, my hats off to you. They're, they, I, I know them personally and they, I know they do it from a good place. And so I salute every single one of them. And so with that, uh, we conclude today's uh, hearing. And for the very last time, I guess.